OK, I suggest that we uh, start slowly. We have almost I think more than 150 participants. So thank you for coming to the sixth Acer NCOE workshop on long term flow based allocation. Uh, uh, yes, as we are getting closer to the implementation, it seems that topics that we are discussing are more interesting, more concrete, as, as well as some issues are more concrete. Well, I think that we will have a lot to talk about today. Um, maybe first some rules on the workshop organization. Uh, our chat will be disabled, so we will better organize it uh, through um, through Slido. So please use Slido for posting your questions and comments. You can use the direct link here, but it will also be copied in the chat. Uh, so you can provide your questions and comments during the whole meeting, during the presentations, but they will be processed uh, during the discussion session. We plan to have a longer discussion ses session at the end of the meeting. Uh, maybe we can take a question or two during or after the presentations, but uh, then the discussion could diverge and there can be many questions, so we would rather keep it mainly for the last session of the meeting or the one before the last. Uh, in, in that session, if you want to provide oral comment, please raise hand and then, then you will get the access to the microphone. Uh, for you to know that the meeting has been recorded and, uh, and that slides will be provided at ASUS website on, on Monday. Uh, the agenda here uh, after the introductory remarks we are having now, uh, Jim Wilson would provide the information on the implementation timeline and basic information about the, the implementation of long term flow based allocation in a short presentation. Then I would say the main topic from today is a Syriax presentation on simulation results of long term flow based auctions, yearly simulations. Uh, after that, uh, Martin Polk would provide Acer's views. Then after that, we will have Jerome Lepage for market participants view, views, but I think some of his colleagues from market participants would also join um, in this session or, or afterwards as well. Upon that, we would have a short session or, again from Martin Polk on the, on the ways forward. Then I would open for the discussion, we reserved more than one hour and, and all these times are indicative, so we will see as it comes. And at the end, we will try to wrap up and Christophe Jean's crew would uh, provide closing remarks. If this is OK with you, I would now hand over to Jim. Jim, please. Thank you, Soren. And good morning, everyone. My name is Jim Wilson. I'm a co-convener of the Market Integration Working Group uh, under NC. I normally, my day, day normal life, I work for Energinet in the Danish TSO. I'm going to try to take over the control. Is the slides moving for you guys? Yes. Perfect. Uh, so what I will uh, from or for, what we from NCOE side will present here is the uh, project implementation, as Soren also said, and sort of the next steps. Uh, we also communicate that uh, the the implementation um, delay in the last MISC, um, and we will also present here the simulation result of the um, long-term flow based allocation, the latest results, which my colleague Sirak will, will present in, in just a few minutes. So if you look at the product implementation and next steps, uh, throughout the implementation uh, product, long-term flow based allocation scope has been extended uh, quite some times. Um, both Acer and us as TSO has increased the requirement for the simulation tool and for for Jiao, um, in terms of uh, also collateral checks and the cal credit calculation, um, which has been updated throughout the four methodologies that we have uh, needed to update to 
to be able to run a long-term flow based allocation um, within the TSOs and Jiao. Um, when we have done these uh, increase of requirements, this has also um, make it hard for Jiao to uh, to prioritize. And as as most of the uh, people in this call are aware, uh, also following the prioritization discussion, is that throughout the next 18 months, we have quite some projects to be imp implemented. Um, IDAS, uh, flow based allocation day ahead in the Nordics, 15 minutes MTU, and, and so on and so forth, uh, which also is products that impact JAL. So this, every time we have moved the, the requirements and uh, sort of moved the delay, it's been impacting JAL uh, and, and their uh, resources, of course. So that has led now that we and JAL is not able to implement long-term flow base allocation by the current deadline, November 2024 for yearly auction of 2025. And this implies that the next deadline then, or the delayed deadline is November, 2025 for the auction of yearly capacity 2026. This is the earliest go live date as the auction needs to start with yearly capacity. Um, and, and this is also a disclaimer here. This is based if we don't do any further update or requirement change in terms of both what the TSOs need and also what IT implementation is needed for Jao. So if we look at the next steps we, um, and what we also communicated in the last uh, MISC is that we don't see a, or there is no feasibility of going live in 2024. That in combination of the upcoming EMDR discussion, the simulation results that market participants and some TSOs have had great concerns about, um, and also the position for the market participants throughout this long-term flow based allocation products actually from the beginning has led us um, to think that there is a need to have a conceptual discussion of the project. When we are focusing our discussions here about price conversion in the forward market, which will lead to increase undervaluation and benefit benefit for the few in combination with EMDR and the need to provide hedging opportunities, cross-border hedging opportunities to all market participants. We see it as an important step here that we get back on track and back on focusing and discussing what is the objective of the forward capacity allocation. In our view, that is to provide hedging opportunities for all market participants. And to sort of initiate this discussion, we from the TSO side have worked uh, on some of the uh, proposed models that's on the table already. We do see that the, the virtual hubs uh, is in the latest EMDR or the, the accepted EMDR, which is of course why we need to, to look at that. But even though virtual hubs is sort of the end goal for many par parties in this conversation here, um, virtual hubs, can be implemented 10 years from now. We have also looked at models that actually can be implemented within a much shorter time period, can be implemented uh, on the medium side, that's the model two here. Um, and this is sort of just the, the first draft of how we see the discussion should take place. We need to focus on how implementable or how easy is it to be implemented these models and when and how will it bring ex benefit to all market participants. Of course, as the discussion on the TSO side is quite early, this there are still some unknown. Some of the models here, especially model two and model three, uh, includes quite an increase of cost to the TSOs in terms of collateral uh, that needs to be posted for on the financial exchanges. 
Um, there's also, of course, a discussion in lines with the long-term flow visa allocation of what volume should be sold on each border. But these are these are issues that we, from the TSO side, it's important to remember that we need to get back and think about that. And that also goes in line with the next topic that my colleague Syriac will present, the simulation result, where we do see quite some um, some change in allocation and zero allocation on some border and over allocation on some other borders. Uh, but I'll leave the floor to Syriac. I saw you turn the, the camera on. But, uh, but once again, we very much welcome the initiative in the last MISC for a conceptual discussion amongst Acer, TSOs and the market participants. Thank you and welcome Syriac. Thank you, Jim. Um, so I will take control now. Um, Hi everyone, so I'm Syriac from uh, Elia. Uh, here I'm going to, to present the, the simulation we uh, we did uh, uh, yeah, in uh, LTFBA. So basically one year ago we presented already some uh, some results. Uh, we decided to to have another workshop when the, when we will use uh, when we would use uh, uh, a robust tool when we will have a better view on uh, core LTCC so capacity calculation and then the allocation how it works together and today we are here to present you the these re these results um, we have already some uh, some conclusions here um, we did a, a lot of different sim uh, simulation with different uh, order books different uh, flow based domain from different years uh, with normalized price weighted normalized price meaning that we 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 tried several different uh, options to uh, to see how the result would uh, would change and that's something that we we will show you uh, um, overall, uh, we will see that the capacity in flow base is lower than in uh, in NTC. Uh, we have some uh, zero or low uh, value of volume allocate, uh, allocated on some border and sometimes in both direction. Um, we we also increased the the minimum for simulation to see what would be the the effect, and we see that this doesn't really mitigate the effect of low and zero allocation on so, on some border. And finally, if we have the uh, these zero, zero or low values, it's also due to our uh, allocation algorithm and the objective function that we that we use because we maximize the bid price times the accepted volume. And that I will explain all of these in uh, in two three slides uh, on the different table with uh, with the results. Basically, what we what we did uh, here, we will show you two uh, two simulations from 2023 and 2022. Um, with the flow based domain of 2023, we used 12 timestamps. Uh, before we uh, we showed you four timestamps so one year uh, one year ago, um, and. We did the di differentiation with 20% minram, 30% minram, and 40% minram using the historical bids for 20, uh, 2022 and 2023. The historical bids that we are taking are the NTC historical uh, auctions. So for that matter, we didn't uh, uh, take in, uh, the competition into uh, into consideration or the one we uh, we we will have in uh, in, in flow based. Um, maybe uh, two small disclaimers uh, for the year 2022. We didn't have the uh, any bids for Slovenia, Hungary, and for 2022 and 2023, we didn't have uh, any bids from the uh, from the Polish border. But in uh, in annex, you will see that we uh, we added the uh, some po Polish bids. So if you want to see what would be the effect uh, with Polish bids, it's also po possible there. Uh, I won't present it today, but it's in Annex, so if you have also any questions, that's uh, possible in the end to see it. Um, and then finally, we uh, so we use uh, a f we have the capacity calculation and you get a flow based domain. And from this flow based domain, we take 80% uh, of the of the capacity that we that we see to use it in yearly. So it leaves some uh, some volume for the for the monthly. So that's the splitting factor that uh, that we talk about here in the in this slide. Um, and 
finally at the bottom what you can see is what i already told you one year ago we did simulations on four time stems so it's less representative from what we have today with another prototype of uh, allocation uh, algorithm and uh, simulation tools and we didn't have some bits like uh, 50 hertz uh, chips uh, or or other uh, other other bits on this slide you can you can see if uh, first results uh, it's separated in uh, in different years so you have first the year 2023 then the year 2022 and al always a comparison with uh, uh, with NT uh, NTC um, and you have the allocated capacity congestion revenue total welfare and market participant surplus here I, I will concentrate on the allocation capacity and what we call here the uh, total welfare the total welfare here maybe it's important to notice uh, on the bottom right side of the the slide you see how it's computed so it's the uh, bid price time the uh, times the allocated volumes so that's what we call here uh, welfare but we uh, we have some discussion uh, on is it re uh, really how to, to def uh, how to define welfare? But at least you know where this uh, this value comes from. Um, and what we can see is that for 20%, 20-30% minimum, we will have less uh, allocated uh, less allocated capacity. Uh, if you go to uh, to 40, you have more, and that's basically our uh, that's basically our um, <clears throat> conclusion. That you can have more minram and allocate more but what we will see on the next slide afterward is that we still have the uh, low uh, the low value on so, uh, on some borders it's just that you you give more capacity and in general more capacity on borders that already has uh, a lot uh, a big volume allo allocated um <clears throat> Um, I already said it, but I say I say it again. For the Pol Polish bids, we uh, we have it in the in in the annex, so uh, uh, don't hesitate to uh, to go there if you if you want to to see what's uh, what's the impact uh, for the for the global message. I would say it doesn't uh, it doesn't really change. I don't know if we if we take question now or if we take it uh, at the end. I saw a hand raise. Uh, I will continue and then maybe uh, take time after afterward for for that. Um, and here I go on the um, a bit deeper on the the results for tw uh, 2023. So uh, like I said, we used uh, histor historical bids. Uh, we have the the first columns are for the 20% minram. Then you have the 30% minram, 40% minram, and then you have uh, comparison with uh, with what what we have in NTC, the um, you can see the the la, uh, the light red uh, boxes are the one where the the allocated capacity is lower than 100 uh, megawatts. Um, as example, in NTC, the lowest uh, the lowest value we we had for a border was 150. So you have nine border. In, uh, for which in one direction you have uh, uh, you have less than 100 megawatt allocated and two borders for for which you have uh, in both direction less than 100 uh, megawatt allocated um, and here it's basically it for for this uh, for this presentation because if you go to the the slide here for uh, 2022 you have more more or less the the, the the same results you see also in uh, in dark red that's the the um, uh, the border where you had already uh, quite a high capacity uh, allocated you have even more if you have more uh, more minram so you can see also what, what's the impact of uh, adding mi uh, minram you see that you have less uh, box in uh, in light red but uh, you still ha you still have some you still have uh, so, uh, some zero uh, zero values so uh, thank you. I think I will uh, then let the presentation. I can go right away to the ASR presentation because the rest is the the annex. I you can go through them if you if you want. But after the presentation, yeah, and Martin, I will Martin, I will give you the word. Thank you. Thank you, Syriac. 
So good morning, everyone. Also from my side, I'm Martin Bob, I come from Acer. Uh, not sure people have questions now. How, Zoran, how do you imagine that? Or should they continue or we have questions at the end? Uh, maybe we can take one question now and okay. and then then uh, continue. But I would really encourage questions at the discussion session. Yeah, Helen, please. No, no. So I just wanted to ask if you can share the the link for the questions because uh, unless it's only me, I don't see it in the chat. And so far, I think we we had two questions uh, for the presentation first of Jim. Um, we just wanted to ask uh, regarding the, the slide you presented with the model 2.0. Um, if you could elaborate on uh, uh, what is uh, the objective around the move to obligation. So if you have a view on what is the, the, the purpose there or what is the, the, the yeah, what, what you try to achieve with, uh, with this uh, switch. And we also had a question um, on the delay. If you can elaborate on, on the reason uh, for uh, the, the fact that it's not possible in November 2024, if you can explain uh, what the issues are just to, to understand uh, a bit better. And again, if you can share the link to the Slido, it would be great. Thank you. Yes, we will uh, again share the link to the Slido in the chat, I think. Uh, just uh, Jim, please, you can answer the, the question in the middle. The, the chat, ju just for, for practical reasons, sorry to insist, but the chat, we cannot access it. So I, I think if you share it, we don't see it. So you don't see it at all? No, exactly, exactly. Okay. Uh, unless it's only me, but uh, I, I, we don't see anything when we click on chat. That's why we don't have the link. Okay. And now it's okay. 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 Thank you. Let's take them one by one. Uh, in terms of moving from options to obligation, it would be to more uh, complement the current market structure that's that's in place already with with futures and forwards uh, to have it uh, compatible to those, uh, and also in order to not uh, put an extra collateral requirement on on uh, market participants, but actually use the current setup that the exchanges has. Uh, some 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 benefits that we think would be beneficial, especially for the model two, where the whole product is to offer zonal futures in in um, in term in the market as as we see some TSOs are doing at the moment. Um, and in terms of the delay, it's it's purely implementation uh, deadlines uh, due to added requirements. Um, more in particular, there are there are quite some extra additions in the last HAR, uh, harmonized allocation rules, that um, is not implement implementable for JAO um, and, and uh, for the TSOs uh, until they go live in 2024. This, does that answer your question, Selene? Uh, yeah, but I think for the, the first question, uh, we would be keen to rediscuss that with you because uh, I'm not sure we I understand, but I'm not sure it's the the goal of today. So we can uh, we can take it away with us. Yeah, yeah. That, that, that could of course be an outcome of, of of today to have to have a discussion on that topic. Uh, we will gladly participate in those discussions. Yeah, today we are focusing on long term flow based. Uh, Maybe the EM discussions can be another workshop on that. Uh, yeah, sure. And on the first question, uh, is it more a problem related to the, the capacity calculation part or more the, the allocation part, really purely the, the, the auction? In terms of obligation or options? No, in terms of delay. I mean, on uh, the fact that it's not feasible now. Uh, is it more related to the, the auction parts of the allocation or is it more uh, related to the, the capacity calculation? So the grid, uh, the grid aspects. Allocation, uh, definitely. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, I, I would suggest we take uh, uh, more questions uh, when the presentations are done. Because you know, it, 
for us it's difficult to distinguish between questions and the results and the conceptual discussions which may be better at the end of the of the presentations propose we move on with our presentation uh, so maybe we can go to the first slide uh, i think from the side we we see the results a bit differently uh, we see them in a more positive light of course there are certain you can say certain uh, changes which uh, may be surprising but uh, uh, I think we can look, also look at them in the more positive light. Uh, uh, and first, I, we would like to mention that uh, we need to know uh, what impacts what. So here, when you look at the results presented by TSOs, uh, we have two impacting factors. One is how much capacity is being offered. And second, how the allocation algorithm actually works. And when you, when you look at the final results, we see the combination of the two factors. And uh, we don't know exactly which factor is having more impact and which factor is having less impact. In this sense, what we are proposing and asking TSOs as well is that we try to disentangle these two impact factors and, and discuss both of them separately. And in this sense, we are proposing that we uh, make for the purpose of disentangling of, of the impacting factors we we analyze what the allocation would look like if you would offer the same amount of capacities as an entity so if you are if you are comparing the results with historical entities then it's also fair that we also offer the same amount of capacities in terms of the domain as in historical entities so uh, only then we have a fair comparison to see how the NPC allocation and flow based allocation actually compare against each other. Our feeling is that uh, we, all three results are still uh, not comparable to historical NTC offered capacities. Maybe the 40% uh, scenario is maybe close, but we are not sure how close it is to historical offered capacities. Uh, this is not to say that, uh, of course, the uh, if if you offer the same amount of capacities, there will be uh, high capacities in every border. But still, we can expect some changes in the results if we make a fair comparison. Next slide, please, sir. So in this sense, indeed, what we would ask for TSOs is to uh, make a test with, uh, with with the flow based domain, which uses historical entities uh, as a benchmark. Uh, this does not mean that we ask this so that they need to offer uh, the same amount of capacity as as historical entities. Uh, sorry, because uh, uh, you know capacities can be different from year to year, but uh, at least. What we think that you know the the offered domain in flow base should not be significantly smaller than historical entity domain. Uh, so in this sense, we are proposing this benchmarking when we are discussing the offered capacities and when we, when, when we are discussing the allocation principles. We need to comp we cannot compare. We need to compare the same things, not not different things. Uh, Uh, please, uh, next slide. So, and here we are uh, want to engage a bit in the uh, conceptual discussion. What is actually the purpose of transmission rights? At least seen from the from the ASU side. So, here I, you know, the the Bible of uh, FCA regulation is Article Nine of uh, of uh, Regulation uh, Nine Point Three, uh, two thousand nineteen. Uh, and here it says the TSO shall issue long transmission rights unless assessment of the forward market on the bidding zone borders performed by the competent regulatory authorities shows that there are sufficient hedging opportunities in the concerned bidding zones. And this highlighted, highlighted point shows that the transmission rights are actually 
indirect mean to increase the hedging opportunities within bidding zones. So if there are, if there are sufficient opportunities within bidding zones, there is no need for transmission rights for horizontal hedging opportunities offered by TSOs. Uh, that's because the horizontal price risks are always a derivation or combination of price risks within the zones. So the price risks within the zones are primary, and price risks across the zones are sort of secondary. They are helping to hedge uh, price risks within the zones. And we see transmission rights as a regulatory support. It's a regulatory policy support to increase hedging opportunities of physical players. So consumers, producers, suppliers, if there is not enough, uh, not, not enough hedging opportunities for them, there is a regulatory support by TSOs uh, to provide these additional hedging opportunities. Uh, and just to simplify, you know, what, what, what hedging price risk is. Uh, so it's mainly, not only, but mainly it's, you know, in simple terms, buying and selling energy in the forward time frame. Uh, so for producers and consumers, hedging is buying and selling energy in the forward time frame. Of course, if you have, if you are buying and selling in different uh, bidding zones, this also requires hedging across the border. But if you only buy in one zone or only sell in one zone, you only buy and sell energy in the forward time frame. And here, what we want to emphasize is that hedging opportunity uh, is not only accessibility of hedging uh, product, but it's also competitiveness. At what price do you get a certain product? So it's not only that you can buy it or sell it, but also at what price is it, is the price competitive? Uh, is the price cheap for consumers? Is the price uh, high enough for uh, producers? Uh, so transmission rights aim to increase both, not just accessibility of hedging products, but also competitiveness of hedging products. Next slide, please. So, and here we often hear the argument that, you know, forward capacity allocation is not about optimizing electricity flows in the long-term time frame. I think we would argue the opposite. It's, it's not only about that, but it's also about that. Uh, because for physical players, hedging is mostly buying and selling forward. And it's important at what price physical players can buy or sell energy in one year ahead, two years ahead. Because this price that they're uh, paying for futures one year ahead, two years ahead, this determine their actual costs and revenues. So if transmission rights can help, uh, can help consumers, producers buy cheaper or more expensive, this is uh, an added, added value of transmission rights you should not forget about. Uh, uh, and that's, you know, that's where we see the added value of flow based, uh, and I will come to that. Next slide, please. So, the key the key argument why why transmission rights actually help consumers, producers, suppliers to hedge more cheaper, more competitively, is that uh, uh, the, the transmission rights bring forward prices closer together. But the more transmission rights you can allocate on certain border, the more the more the forward prices on both sides of the bidding zones will come closer together. Uh, and in this uh, in this slide, we can uh, we can we can show that, or we can see that uh, the bid order curves uh, on on both sides are slightly slightly tilted. Uh, which means that supply from bidding zone A uh, can, uh, with the help of transmission rights, can help meet the demand of bidding zone B. So simple arbitrage principle, uh, you can buy in A, uh, buy transmission rights and sell in B. And by that you can uh, increase the uh, supply in B, you increase the demand in A, and by that the prices in the two markets will move slightly closer together. 
and transmission rights does enable to meet supply in cheaper markets with demand in more expensive markets. If you look at arbitrage principle, you, you, you know that this will actually happen. Uh, and one argument we often hear that is that, that no, the forward markets are not going to be impacted by, by, by the volume of transmission rights because you know the expectation of the spot price is the only thing that uh, determines the forward price. I would, I would say this is partly true if everybody would have the same expectation about the uh, spot price. But because market participants have different expectations, everybody has different understanding what spot price fundamentals will be. We have different forecasts. That's why this curves at which they're willing to sell and buy in the forward market, they're not flat, but they are tilted, tilted a bit. This tilting actually represents different expectations about uh, about the future. Uh, because of different expectations, because of different different uh, uh, in order curves, we can expect that uh, transmission rights, more transmission rights, will lead to higher price convergence in the forward market. Uh, and just a, a thought experiment. I'm not saying this is uh, uh, what we're going to do. But if you can imagine that there will be in infinite amount of transmission rights uh, offered on every border, we can for sure expect that in this case we would have full forward price convergence. Even though we know physically this will not happen, but even, even if it doesn't happen physically in the spot market, if you offer infinite transmission rights in the forward market, the forward prices will converge to, to zero. Uh, uh, so, Next slide, please. So what we see and what Syria also showed before that indeed we have in some borders much higher capacities, in some borders much lower capacities. Uh, this is what we call competition between between the borders. Uh, and if you look at which borders get more capacity, you see that the borders which have a higher price difference, which have a high forward spread. Uh, and borders which have lower or, or, or no capacity, they have comparatively very low spread. Uh, and of course, the flow-based algorithm works the same way as the same way as in the ahead. Uh, the bidding zones, which are very close together in terms of price, will get almost no allocated capacity. And the bidding zones, which have a higher price difference, uh, higher opportunities to arbitrage, will get uh, higher will get higher value of uh, the transmission rights. Next slide, please. Uh, again, this this slide we show already in the previous workshop, and it's important to to remember. The most prominent example was looking at the German-French border for the uh, to the two yearly auction. So the the forward spread uh, of the, on the two, on the on the on this border was about seventy four point five euros exactly at the time of the auction, uh, and the NTC auction price was eight euros, whereas the flow based auction price was forty six euros. Uh, this this is all, this is really, really really important to understand uh, what's happening here. Uh, and of course, we can we can have different interpretation, but bear 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 with me how we interpret that uh, that apparent uh, discrepancy if you look at both results. Next slide, please. Uh, so, if you look at efficient arbitrage uh, principle, the forward spread and the long term transmission rate prices must be in equilib equilibrium. So if if there is a big difference, there will be arbitrage. You know, there's obvious arbitrage opportunities, and this and the and the two will go back to equilibrium. So, if flow-based allocation will give much more allocated capacities, uh, much more allocated capacities will lead to a lower price difference or lower price in the transmission rights. This does not mean that transmission rights are being undervalued, uh, not at all. So, this just means that there is more allocated capacities. Uh, the market will expect that all, already before the auction. Uh, this not does not mean that the forward price will remain uh, at the, this high level. The market will simulate the the flow based allocation result. Will know that there will be much more capacity on this border, 
and the forward price difference will already go down before the transmission rights allocation. And after the auction, it will only correct for the uh, for the forecast error. So if the market expectation and actual allocation results are different, then after allocation, there is only re remaining uh, disequilibrium to be uh, to be corrected for. Uh, but still, you know, assuming that uh, indeed the, the transmission rights go from 80 euros to 46 euros, this can approximately mean that uh, actual price forward price difference will go from uh, 74 euros to, to, to 46 euros. And this means that the forward price difference will be will be lower and much lower than uh, than it was in the NTC environment. Uh, so the point is that the volume of transmission rights will affect the price prices of uh, futures on both sides. In this case, for example, we can expect that the French futures, because the market market has less depth than the than the German market, will go significantly down. Uh, and this the lower price of French futures will enable consumers producers to buy. Uh, to buy sell uh, price uh, these this futures at lower price or uh, and that is important uh, benefit of this uh, of this result um, next slide please so in this sense we in we would like to emphasize that uh, the overall impact of flow based is to increase market integration so to to bring those forward prices closer together to increase the price convergence but of course uh, you know if you assume the same level of capacity being offered uh, and that and that is the objective of the flow based algorithm to increase the economic surplus economic surplus in the whole region in, increases the price convergence uh, and that is the benefit we should not forget about Next slide, please. Uh, yeah, before I go to that, you know, if you have if you have doubts about whether the volume of transmission rights impact the forward market or not, because this this part is very complex. We have to admit we, we were discussing this with many stakeholders, professors, uh, you know, experts. Uh, I can I can only point to you by the study done by the Neon. Uh, it's a consultant study done by but done for for the German TSO. So I think it's available online. It it has a bit a lot of uh, theoretic theoret theoretical uh, insight on how that what's the relationship between transmission rights and forward markets. But it clearly confirms that the volume of the transmission rights does have the impact on forward prices. Uh, uh, so you can you can find the rational rational there. You can find the uh, the, the reasoning there. Uh, of course, they will say, you know, we need to be careful how much we allocate because if we allocate too much, we may we may uh, let's say uh, 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 bring the forward parts too close together, more closer than the than what is possible by the physical capacity. Uh, but but the point is that the the volume of transmission rights does have the impact on on the on the forward prices uh, on both sides of the of the border. The final two slides I want to mention is that uh, the the spread in the forward market is also quite well correlated with the volatility of the of the of the spread. So here we made it, made an analysis how. What's the correlation between the annual spreads and volat annual volatility on all core borders? So we took all the core borders uh, and we calculated uh, the spread, annual spread, and ca calculated annual volatility. For, for volatility, we took the variance or sta and standard deviation, so two types of measures. And then we do the correlation. You know, is uh, the question is, are the borders with higher spread also having higher volatility? Is there any relationship or not? And what we see is that in most cases, yes, uh, the borders with higher spread also have higher volatility. 
in some in some years this this correlation is a bit lower but still in general you can you can say this is a a good good approximation that borders with uh high spread will also have high volatility uh and in the next slide zona please uh, we have uh the same results for the uh, directional spread so if you look at only one uh one direction in this case the correlations are better but of course because uh, you know the lots of zeros in the statistics uh, in the in the correlation analysis that's why this uh, this results are better but but yeah, the, the point we're trying to make here is that uh, uh, the borders which have higher spread also have higher well higher price volatility uh, so th those two sort of move together uh, and I think this was my last slide for for this part. Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, just also to remind me, remind a bit. You know, why are we here, and where do we stand currently? So this this project has a lot of history behind. Uh, uh, you know, the FC regulation that entered into force in 2016. Then. Uh, uh, there needs to be a proposal for long-term capacity calculation. I think this is six months after approval of the DAIAT capacity calculation. And we had a lot of discussions uh, with TSOs and RAs about what to do uh, because the, the simulation of uh, TSOs first tried with coordinated NTC approach. Uh, there were a lot of discussions because the coordinated NTC approach in mesh network is a challenge. You need to decide how to split capacities between the borders. There are a lot of discussions how to do that. Uh, what's the basis for splitting? Uh, a lot of uh, ideas, you know, what should be the basis? Uh, also a bit of, uh, I would say softly like, competition among TSOs and arrays, you know, what, uh, who should get more capacity on which, on which border. Uh, but at the end, you know, there was a lot, lot of delay uh, because of that. Uh, there was no, we didn't see, see a way forward. And at the end, it was more or less common agreement that the coordinated entity approach is at that end. So we didn't see, we didn't see a way forward to to proceed with coordinated data C. And, and for that reason, TSOs then start working on the flow-based approach. They propose the flow-based uh, methodology. This was later approved by, by Acer. And then subsequently, uh, there were four different methodologies being amended for the allocation part. Uh, uh, so the Firmness and firmness remuneration cost uh, algorithm methodology. Sorry, not the algorithm. The, the single allocation platform methodology, uh, uh, HAR methodology. So all these methodologies have been amended. A lot of work being done on that as well on TSO sides on the Acer side. And we are now, you know, one or two years ahead of implementation. Uh, uh, so it's not so easy to discuss, you know, just changing something uh, completely or discarding everything. Uh, there is a lot, lot of history behind, uh, a lot of reasons behind why we are here where we are. Uh, next slide, please. So just summary, what, what we have learned from the past is that agreeing on coordinated NTCs in core CCR was not possible. Uh, this led to difficult discussions on who should get capacity and why. At that time, you know, we also proposed a statistical approach instead of scenario-based approach, but it was too early for TSOs to swallow this change. So we, we end, ended up with scenario-based approach, uh, even though some, you know, if you look at from today's, today's perspective, it might have been better to go for a statistical approach, but at that time, it uh, the time wasn't uh, right enough. And, and final point I want to make is that we are already under significant de delay. So if if we look at when implementation would normally have to be done is in February 2022, 
if we take into account six months for approval of the methodology and about two years of implementation. So, uh, and we are far behind this legal deadline. Uh, and yeah, we should not forget about uh, that we are in the we are in delay and that uh, there are certain legal legal obligations to be to be met. Next slide. I'm not sure if I have anything else. No, that's all for my set. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. There are already some questions in the slide, though, but uh, before uh, going to them, we would like also to first to, let's say, group them and coordinate, uh, co coordinate on them. So I suggest that uh, we continue with Jerome's slides and then discuss later. Perfect. Thank you very much, Soran. Um, and Jim, Syriac, and, and Martin for the, the intervention interventions previously. Um, so my name is Jérôme Lepage. I chair the uh, Electricity Committee at Energy Traders Europe. Um, and the slides um, I'm going to present today have been uh, um, developed in common with, uh, with my colleagues from Euroelectric, um, who are also on the call. Um, so if there's any any specification to add, um, they, they, they are welcome also to take the floor. Um, so we're going to present a few thoughts um, and reflection on, on how to make sure that the, um, that the long term transmission rights um, indeed meet um, the market's hedging needs. Um, and we're going to start um, because it's it's both a technical debate, but also a, like a conceptual debate indeed today um, as a as a reminder um, why we're collectively um, working on all this and and what we're trying to improve. So small reminder um, about forward markets um, and actually to start with irrespective of long term transmission rights. Um, forward markets are here primarily um, to um, help market participants hedge um, their positions um, in advance of real time um, to make sure that um, some of the price and volume risks um, are being um, um, secured or like there's some form of insurance against um, short term uh, fluctuations of those prices and volumes. Um, this is something that is um, important for consumers, uh, but also for producers, um, each of them having also different time horizons at which um, they seek to hedge their portfolio. In any case, um, how can that be done effectively? Um, you need forward markets that are liquid, meaning that there's um, a large number of market participants in that market and that they are active in that market, um, which is often um, um, seen um, through the bid aspirates. Um, the lower the bid aspirates between the bids and asks of different market participants on that market, um, the more liquid it can be qualified. Those markets also need to be deep, um, meaning that um, there's sufficient energy uh, that is traded on those markets to make sure that any order doesn't affect specifically um, the the price um, in that uh, in that market, and they need to be long enough or with long enough maturities. Um, so the longer uh, or the earlier in advance of real time you can trade, um, the better to help um, different types of market participants hedge their different needs. So that's just like general reminder on forward markets on what we as market participants really seek um, in um, in those markets. Now, looking at long term transmission rights in particular, um, I think it was um, some of the, the elements that uh, that Martin mentioned earlier, the link between the forward electricity market and the long term transmission rights is quite important um, because long-term transmission rights complement um, the electricity forward market um, in the sense that it contributes to decreasing the cost of hedging on the electricity market 
um, and it allows actually or provides tools um, to reduce the cross zonal risk um, and especially the volatility um, between different markets um, that are experienced by market participants who try to hedge a position across a border um, or try to um, perform proxy hedging um, in a neighboring market. Um, the way long-term transmission rights have been constructed at the very least on the continent um, is, has been really to make sure that there's access um, in advance of real time to that capacity. Um, initially physically more and more through financial transmission rights um, to the um, yeah to an image of that capacity um, in advance of real time um, last point on on resetting the the framework um, the legislation so far um, with the regulation 2019 um, and the FCA guideline really focus on um, cross zonal capacity calculation on the one hand and allocation of long term transmission rights on the other hand, um, with very little elements on the forward electricity markets themselves. Um, so, um, so indeed they're mentioned um, and the liquidity of such markets is um, is mentioned as important but the legislation really goes in depth like mainly on the capacity aspects so of both calculation and allocation with the um, reform of market design um, that will uh, should be approved shortly um, there's a greater focus on the liquidity of forward electricity markets themselves um, and to try to find means to make sure that this effective hedging of price risk, irrespective of whether this is within one zone or across bidding zones. Um, and this is, yeah, of course, like the famous um, impact assessment that um, will need to be performed by the European Commission um, with different elements that relate both to liquidity within zones um, and liquidity across zones. So this is a little bit for setting the stage. Now, looking at where we are at the moment, we're going to spend a little bit of time on um, the uh, the question of long term flow based allocation. We are um, seeing that um, or we've the, the delay of long term flow based allocation implementation um, has been announced by um, by the TSOs about a month ago. Um, and we uh, today we understand that uh, the earliest feasible um, new deadline would be um, in November 2025, which is a little bit something we expected. Um, with so then we have about a year and a half um, until um, this is likely to be um, restarted or that the go live of long term flow based allocation is likely to happen. Um, in the meantime, um, the European Commission is likely to start their own assessment of um, the health of forward market and possible improvements to it or tweaks to it. Um, so we see different parallel processes um, and though indeed Martin um, rightly um, recalled that there, there are some deadlines that are in place um, at the moment on long term flow based allocation, um, we see that this will also come um, in conjunction with some studies um, around the, the functioning of forward markets and its possible developments. So the question is really for us, how do we make the most of this new context um, where it's not only going to be about improvement to the current system, but potentially like a greater reflection on how those markets function and how the long term rights um, are being allocated um, with all kinds of uh, small improvements or quick wins um, to massive changes in the system. What we are concerned with um, on the side of Energy Traders Europe and Euroelectric 
um, with the developments around um, long-term flow-based allocation or the allocation on a flow-based methodology of, of long-term transmission rights are three things. Um, this is this is not a surprise. We've mentioned those at, at, at a number of occasions. The first one is a um, bit fundamental um, around the economic efficiency gain. Um, so that's that's the requirement that is in the um, in the regulation um, and the FCA guideline um, around making sure that the um, the allocation on a flow based methodology um, actually does bring um, um, additional economic efficiency compared to a coordinated NCC approach. Um, and for the moment, um, and we'll go into that, we've um, seen how there are some projections um, around the economic surplus of that auction. Um, but so far, we're still in doubt, or let's say the market um, still remains to be convinced around the actual economic efficiency uh, beyond um, the concept of the auction in itself. Now, bearing in mind that general concern, um, there are also two related concerns um, directly linked to the fact that uh, flow-based allocation means one allocation through a single auction based on an optimization algorithm that seeks to, to um, optimize and increase um, the auction surplus, which is, so that's our number two, the fair access uh, to capacity for all market participants. Um, because in that single auction, um, borders will compete between themselves for capacity. Um, and that creates dangers of low um, or zero capacity at some borders. This was exemplified in some of the TSO's um, projections. Um, and number three, um, uh, concerns around how to make the best use possible of capacity. Um, and that's very much related to the question of collateral posting um, for a massive auction for the whole region, um, whereby the, the bids themselves may be de-optimized just because, um, because of the collateral requirements that, um, that are um, far too high. So we'll go into uh, those one, two, and three elements um, in turn, and you'll see we'll spend a little bit more time on the second one um, around the fair access uh, to capacity for all market participants in all regions. So the first concern um, around the economic efficiency uh, of the long-term flow-based allocation um, of transmission rights. Um, one thing that um, we want to remind, um, and there I think that we we're not completely in line with with uh, with Ma what Martin said earlier. Um, in especially in the core region, um, when we talk about allocating long-term transmission right, we're not talking about allocating flows. The allocation of electricity flows at borders happens in the day ahead and intraday time frame. Um, here um, we're talking about maybe the projection in the long term um, or far in advance of real time of flows that will be allocated in the day ahead and intraday market. And I think this is quite different. Um, and we also see and this was um, recalled earlier, that the choice for flow-based allocation, not for the flow-based capacity calculation, but for the allocation, um, was largely guided by difficulties in an implemented coordinated NTC. Bearing all this in mind, um, there have been simulation um, by the TSOs and rerun by Acer, um, and more are coming. Uh, today around um, the economic surplus that um, that long term flow based um, in general with or without minerams um, can add to ATC. Um, two things around this, um, so it it does look at uh, 
the benefits um, of the uh, of the flow based auction in itself um, or the flow based system as a whole, not necessarily distinguishing um, between the calculation aspect of it um, and the allocation aspect of it. Um, and this was also pointed out by Martin. Um, and indeed, we do agree that it will be very important to look into this. Um, and generally, um, this is also where we see that the benefits of the flow based auction in itself will need to be distinguished from the benefits of um, the allocate, like the calculation um, more specifically. So understanding which part um, belongs to which element of the whole flow based system will be will be very important. Um, the fact that we see a difference at the moment between um, the NTC, um, the existing NTC allocation um, and projections around um, flow based calculation plus allocation um, doesn't necessarily highlight, make us understand um, how um, the evolution and the fluctuation of flow based parameters versus the fluctuation of NTC parameters, um, like how this combines and especially how um, the, um, the element of making sure that we allocate so the allocation part um, of the system will ensure like added value and economic efficiency of the system. And we also need to better understand um, how specific modes of allocating transmission rights um, and or calculating the capacity for them will be compatible with some possible evolutions that um, the European Commission has been tasked to study um, for uh, the years to come. So including multi-year transmission rights or more frequent auctions, et cetera, et cetera. That makes us come to uh, like the proposals around, like our proposals from the market around these elements, which is to make sure that, so today we see um, quite a lot of new data coming. Um, some of it we very much welcome. Um, deeper analysis. Um, we'd we'd love to make sure that those um, those elements, this new data, um, is um, fully understood and broken down um, in the different elements. Um, but we think this is truly part also of um, the European Commission's tasks around um, their impact assessments. So of course, um, from the ASO side, from the TSO side and our side, we're doing work on this question of long-term flow values allocation. But understanding how this is future proof, um, um, understanding the actual economic efficiency of the system itself and how it works with potential different um, um, amendments of the forward markets is going to be extremely important. Um, so those are things we believe strongly should be part of the impact assessment of the European Commission in the, in the 18 months or so to come. Um, and this is really a plea that we have um, on our side. So I'll close here for the point one. Um, we'll go to point two um, around, um, so our concern too on how to guarantee fair access to long-term transmission rights at all core borders. Um, as I said earlier, the single auction with an optimization um, function seeking to increase the auction surplus means that um, there is a, um, a competition between different borders um, at the same time. Um, the results of that, and we've seen that in the in some of the simulations that uh, that Syriac um, presented earlier, uh, there are some borders with zero capacity at all, and quite a lot of borders with um, fairly low capacity, while others, some borders um, have like um, an exponential volume of capacity that is allocated to them. Um, 
here is not so much what we uh, we are proposing or what we look at, um, but, um, or what we uh, would love um, other partners to look at. Um, but we did some homework on our site um, together, like Energy uh, Traders Europe and Euro Electric. Um, we commissioned simulations by by Ensight um, to see um, how guaranteeing, so applying some mitigation measures to the long-term flow-based allocation and how guaranteeing certain minimum volumes of capacity at each border of the core region, um, what the effect of that would be um, on the economic surplus um, um, generated by the auction itself. Um, so we'll present that in the next few slides. But fundamentally, we looked at what effect all things equal um, this could have, like the basically allocating the equivalent of 50% of the historical capacities allocated through the NTCs in the past would have on um, the auction surplus. And we compare that also to um, small variations um, in flow based parameters to understand the orders of magnitude of what does it what does it mean to change the allocation part? So applying minimum volumes. What does it change compared to the calculation part? Like what what would happen if there were small modification in PTDFs and RAMs, etc., applied by the TSOs? Um, so in the next three slides, I'm going to go over that, like the, the exercise that we've done with, uh, with consults of, um, by, from Insight. Um We're going to go rather quickly around it. Um, the consultants are here with us. Um, so if there are any specific um, detailed questions, we'll be, we'll be happy to take them and for them, them to, to help us answer those. Um, basically, we took um, a little bit like the initial um, simulation of the TSOs last year. We took four um, time timestamps spread out um, throughout the year. Um, we did use um, day ahead flow based um, domains um, since until um, now at least the uh, the flow based domain computed by the TSO were not um, publicly available. Um, and um, and we made sure that no neck um, is violated um, when ensuring 50% uh, of the average allocated capacity over the three past years. So basically, sometimes we increase domains. Um, the optimization function um, of the flow based auction, so the, the seeking to increase um, the auction surplus was not changed. And um, and we use bids, historical bids. We didn't try to recreate um, bids. We 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 used bids from uh, from the past auctions. What we saw um, is that guaranteeing uh, fifty percent of historical ATCs um, has um, a general effect that is rather small, and that's you see. Um, in the middle line of this table, um, gu guaranteeing quite a significant um, um, proportion of historical ATCs has a minus per, minus one percent effect on the auction surplus, all things equal. Um, almost no effect on the volumes and a small decrease of price. With different borders that are diff affected differently. Um, and this kind of is the whole point of the exercise by basically making sure that capacity is available at least to a certain extent at each border. There is a reorganization um, and a redistribution um, of, um, of the capacities from one border to the other, kind of to correct um, the effect that we've seen presented by Syriac earlier um, of very high capacities at certain borders and very low capacity at others. Um, so in overall, we see that applying a sort of patch to ensure that minimum capacities are available at each border in Europe 
of course leads to a degradation of the different indicators. That makes sense. It's like applying a patch to a like mathematically sane formula, um, but that this the proportions of this the proportion of this degradation or the magnitude of this degradation is quite small. If we present that in maybe a more visual way, um, that's a little bit how the functions evolve on the different um, indicators. So really like what we saw and if we set up a cutoff line here in the dotted line around 50 or like guaranteeing 50% of the historical NTCs, not touching anything else um, on um, the optimization function of the long term flow based auction. Um, we see that um, the auction surplus is um, just degraded, de de decreased by 1%. By the way, that 1% is born mainly, that degradation of the, the economic surplus is born mainly by market participants. Um, while in, if we look at the details, actually um, the TSO's consumption, co uh, congestion income does increase. So is this question of how do we make sure there's capacity available at all borders? Um, and why as market participants, um, we are keen to look into things like this, which actually um, have us maybe um, lose a little bit in the auction, um, is to make sure that we come back to this question of fair access. Um, so it's this question of making sure that at the different biddings on borders, um, there's not an equal access, there never be an equal access, but a more fair access to cross-zonal transmission capacity. And this is quite important. This is quite important, notably um, a, with the view that like um, increasing the auction surplus in itself um, is an interesting, is an important optimization function for the auction in itself, but it doesn't take account of all the externalities around the auction and especially making sure that different market participants from different zones um, and especially from less liquid zones do have access to cross zonal capacity. So what I told you about for now um, was looking at the flow based allocation parts um, and how we could potentially tweak that um, to make sure that there is um, there is capacity guaranteed at all borders. Um, and we wanted to understand what that minus 1% um, of, of auction surplus meant in comparison to possible um, variations in the capacity calculation parts. So we looked, we asked NSIT um, to look into small variation in, um, in flow-based parameters, um, so mainly PTDFs and RAMs, um, and make them vary between 5 and 10%. Here we present the, the, the minus, minus 10 plus 10%. It's like random variations. And through those variations, um, there's um, like looking at those variations, um, there's an impact of this variation of minus, like almost minus 3% of the auction surplus. Um, so again, this is all things equal based on the head flow based domains. Um, but this, um, this shows um, how the potential impact of um, um, things that move in the calculation and things that move in the allocation. Um, like it shows their order of magnitude and how um, we could potentially decide to focus on one or the other and put mitigation measures on one or the other. Having presented this, and this is very, um, this is going very fast um, in the in the great um, study and all the underlying data that 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 NSAID has been um, providing to us. We um, we do have some recommendations, um, and this um, 
this is specifically related to the extra time that we have between now and November 2025, at the very least, um, is look at, OK, we still need, in terms of our concern one, to make sure that um, we fully understand the economic efficiency of long-term flow-based allocation, in addition to the calculation. Um, we need to understand how this will be applicable in the future, but in the meantime, long-term flow base does remain something which is mandated by deadlines set by Acer. Um, and we need to understand um, if we can all agree, and hopefully that we can all agree to make sure that there are mitigation measures in place to make sure that minimum capacities are allocated at all core borders. Um, and agree on a specific methodology and on the metric. Um, what we looked at, the historical ATCs um, allocated over the past three years may not be the perfect metric, but it was one that we chose and it could be another one. Um, and it's really the time now, uh, we believe, to discuss um, how to guarantee minimum capacities and um, on what to base them. And of course, to test that solution, make sure that it's something that is implementable by Jiao, um, and um, that is this is available before go live. Um, because once again, and as we've seen in other projects, what is important to us is really to make sure um, that we have an instrument that is implemented. When it's implemented, that brings positive um, benefits for um, for the market and for society as a whole, so improving social welfare. Our concern, third concern, you remember, um, was around making sure that we use capacity best. And that means that market participants are able to bid where it's important for them and are able to um, um, to secure capacity where they need it and where it's going to um, help their local hedging. Um, so, reminder, one flow based option means all capacity bids for all borders are placed at the same time. Um, and that means they also need to be financial guaranteed at the same time. So this creates something very complex and financially very uh, burdensome for market participants um, to a level where they may choose to place one bid or the other um, when they didn't have to make that choice earlier. Because remember, the capacity options for different border were sequential. Um, so you didn't have a, um, a set aside of so much financial guarantee at once. Um, so we know that the core TSOs have been studying um, different um, different uh, options to limit our um, collateral requirement or reduce those collateral requirements while still making sure um, that those options are finally secure for them. Um, Acer has approved the solution currently proposed by the TSO while still like looking at a long term possibility. Um, we believe that it's very important that um, the ultimate solution, which looks at um, forward electricity markets uh, price spreads to set a cap on those collateral requirements and includes build filtering during the auction process, um, it, it is not the enduring solution at the end of uh, at the end of the process, but is the solution that needs to be implemented for the auction from the beginning. Um, so this is key to make sure that those caps are calculated the right way and also that bids are not filtered at the wrong moments um, in the long process um, of bidding and then um, the actual running of the auction. So our proposals on this um, is really again to make sure that we use the time that we have until at least November 2024. Um, uh, 2025, sorry, um, to make sure that that enduring solution is included in the TSOs and we understand also JAO's pipeline um, and make sure this is um, properly tested and implemented before go live. 
I'll finish. Um, and so, so this is the third part, not the second second part, um, in terms of our proposal for the way forward. Just remember where we stand. Again, forward markets are essential for market participants. Um, they still represent an enormous part of how electricity is being traded. Um, and remember that um, and we've seen that in all the discussions around market design reform, um, that their importance has been highlighted in terms of making sure um, that they help shield consumers um, against short-term price risks um, and all the market participants also get, are, uh, against a series of risks. Um, and they also contribute to sending signals for investments um, to electricity producers, to flexibility developers, um, but also to um, the system operators for investments in, in transmission or distribution. Long-term transmission rights are an important um, complement to forward electricity markets. They're not the, um, the end of it um, by far, um, but um, so they're, they're part of that system and we wish them to remain so. Um, and they do uh, make sure that, um, especially in the case of, of um, transactions or borders or proxy hedging, um, that they provide um, an extra way um, to protect yourself as a market participant or against those, those risks that we just mentioned. And while um, this is all great in theory. We've seen yeah, a renewed interest from decision makers and policy makers over the past few months um, around the need to make sure that those markets function well, um, especially to protect consumers. And our proposed way forward, um, we, we've highlighted a number of recommendations. We thought it would be good to kind of see what we can all do. Um, and we're not alone. Um, the Commission, Acer, the TSOs and us market participants are kind of in the same boat on this um, and we all have things to do, um, at least we believe so. Um, and we have seen things to do in a certain time frame. Um, so here are um, our proposals to make sure that we use our time and we use the resources that we have efficiently. Um, first, like within the time that we have um, until November 2025, um, and then for whatever comes next, once we know what the forward markets will look like um, in the years to come. But especially um, making sure that um, on the European Commission side, um, that we don't just have um, something in the impact assessment that looks just in abstract um, at the elements that have been highlighted in, in the legislation, but how fundamentally um, they work with what we're doing now in terms of implementing flow-based calculation and allocation. And if that is compatible with all the evolutions um, that are planned on the ACER side also, looking at um, sharing data, same for the TSO, um, around the projections that have been made. Um, on the SU side, making sure that um, as much as we understand it's difficult to uh, to say it's okay, that deadline slip, um, making sure that there is a clear new deadline that is set at least until November 2025. Um, so that we understand how we can get to work, the TSOs can understand how they can get to work, et cetera, et cetera. Um, on the TSO side, we'd love to make sure um, that those mitigation measures, some of the examples of which we presented, are, are studied and tested, um, and also that we move ahead with the implementation of, of limitations to collateral requirements. Um, and we're also happy to make sure that um, that will chip in um, in the impact assessment of the Commission and that um, we contribute as much as we can to the TSO work on, on mitigation measure in, in especially. So all this with tight timelines, 
there's going to be a lot of work to do by November 2025 or before November 2025. Um, and then we'll see where we are from there and how we can continue improving forward markets and the allocation of LTTRs. Thank you very much, Jerome. Um, yes, we are collecting the questions in the Slido. Uh, many are related to previous simulations and, and Martin's presentation. Uh, there are also some questions to you, Jerome. So uh, Martin would have a, a couple of slides uh, here on, on ACER's proposals also, also on the way forward. And I suggest that you maybe take your time and check the questions so we can then jump in uh, the discussion session afterwards. I will take control now. Thank you, Zoran. So uh, we put this slide deck at the end only because we, you know, uh, we wanted to give you further floor to present your uh, uh, proposals. Uh, uh, and maybe on the first slide, uh, we, we of course welcome uh, discussions about alternatives. What are the possible ways to 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 go forward? Maybe so they can go to the first slide. Um, so we have been uh, uh, seeing with lots of interest the proposal of minimum ATCs. As we said, we are open to discuss the solution. Uh, we have some immediate concerns which may not be a blocking point but still it's important to highlight them uh, if we have them so first first concern is you know how do we agree on those minimum ATCs uh, given that we tried to agree on uh, NTCs in the past and uh, we entered into a, a, a discussion who should get more or less and you know uh, what's the what was the criteria and basis for getting more or less uh, 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 these discussions were difficult uh, we didn't see the end of them and uh, this might appear the same here uh TSO analysts will say well historical entities historical entities are not a good basis because some have too much some have too, too little and uh, yeah we're afraid to open that Pandora's box. Second concern is maybe a bit minor, but still important. Uh, what if the minimum ATCs domain is not visible in certain auctions? So, you know, because we have yearly auction, monthly auction, monthly will be about 20% of the yearly. Monthly auction become monthly domain becomes quite small. And how do you adjust the minimum ATCs to monthly domains, which are, which are quite smaller compared to yearly? You may quickly end up with a situation where minimum ATCs would be outside of of the available domain, uh, and then the question is what to do with those cases. Uh, then the question is, of course, you are right. We lose a bit of economic efficiency if you apply minimum ATCs, uh, which may be okay. But then we need to know. What do we gain by that? How do we measure this economic gain? Uh, so how do we objectively assess what have we gained? So what have we lost and what have we gained is the cost benefit positive if you do that if you do that. Uh, so maybe a measure of economic gain by with minimum ATCs would be uh, welcome uh, so that we can all agree that you know by doing that we gain more than what we have lost. Uh, uh, and final one is the a bit concerns on the legality of the proposals. So if we go that way, we would need to change the uh, first the, the capacity calculation methodology to make those minimum ATCs legal. And then also amending uh, other methodologies which are related to flow based. There are six of them all together. So two capacity calculation methodologies and four methodologies which support allocation uh, and cost sharing. And finally, I I, I have to uh, highlight uh, Article 16.6 of electricity regulation, which says that uh, in case of congestion, the highest value bids for network capacity, whether implicit or explicit, uh, uh, offering the highest value for sparse transmission capacity in a given time frame shall be successful. This basically means the bids which offer the highest value for certain capacity 
must get capacity. So bits which which get the lowest bits bits which offer lowest value will not get capacity. And in case of flow base, we are actually allocating RAMs. You know, these are these are remaining available margins on the on the critical network elements. So we need to make sure that those who offer the highest value for those megawatts of RAMs, those get capacity on those RAMs. So we cannot discriminate and, and allocate allocate uh, 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 megawatts on network elements to bits which have offered less than bits which have offered more. This principle is uh, yeah sort of enshrined in the regulation. Uh, and we need to be careful about that. Uh, second slide, please, Zoran. Uh, so, the looking into the future. So, the question is, uh, is this long-term flow based a step in the wrong direction, or is it a, a step towards the right direction? And maybe just two points I want to highlight uh, about the future discussions we have in the EMD. So, in the EMD, we said, okay. We need to go towards statistical approach in the future because if we want to implement maturities up to three years ahead, we need to, need to go towards statistical approach because TSOs will not start building common grid models for three years ahead. That's very difficult. Uh, uh, there is no appetite for that. So it's it's clear that if you look at these time frames, you need to go to statistical approach for capacity calculation. And in core CCRs, you no, know, in in five, ten years, there will be no statistics on NTCs or ATCs. Uh, so the only statistics you have from the ahead is the flow based parameters. So, in this sense, in core CCR, CCR, the statistical approach can only be based on the flow based parameters. That's maybe first consideration uh, we need to take into account. The second, you know, in the EMD. There were discussions about which model to take, but in our view, there is the essence. The essence of discussion was either we have zone to zone, or we have zone to hub. So that this remains open, but the way we understand these two models are on the table. Uh, and when we talk about zone to zone, I I guess we talk about any zone to zone. Uh, you know, because if you, if you want to offer transmission right, direct transmission right from Hungary to Germany or from Romania to Germany. So if anybody wants to have one leg transmission right from its zone towards the liquid hub, that would be the way to go. So to have any zone to any zone transmission right would be, I would say, a no regret uh, approach if we go towards this model. So and any zone to any zone transmission rights also require competition among the borders. So you, you cannot ex ante define what's the capacity between Germany and Germany, Hungary, or Poland and France. You need to you need to offer the whole domain, and then the competition will determine which combination zone, zone to zone will get certain transmission right. So in this respect, even with zone to zone model, the flow base and competition among the borders is seems like a must uh, or seems like a, no other way. And the same applies for zone to hub. So zone to hub essentially requires to, to have competition among different borders, among different products. Uh, and uh, so I'm trying to say here that whatever we are discussing in, in, in EMD, it's likely that the competition among the borders, among the bidding zones will be a key feature of that. Uh, uh, I don't I don't see how not to, but maybe maybe we don't see something. Uh, last slide, Zoran, please. So, what would be our propo proposed way forward, or at least what we put on the on the table? So, the FCA 2.0 process uh, will not be very quick. I hope we can all agree on that. So, in our estimates, the best possible. Uh, timeline we are looking at is 2030 and and beyond. So if you look at for the entry into force of FCA, we will need about 2.5 years uh, at least. 
And then after entering the force, there are certain methodologies to be developed, approved and implemented. And this process will take at least four years. Uh, so we are looking at implementation before, not before 2030. Uh, so this means we cannot just stop existing uh, projects and you know say, well, we will do everything uh, when FCA 2.0 uh, comes. So we have we have to do something before 2030. 30. Uh, yeah, but we also see that that you know that the latest simulations by TSOs did not show effectively different patterns from what we have made and shown to everybody in 2021. I, I, I don't know the, the date exactly. So at, at that time, when we made the decision. We showed similar results, similar pattern. Uh, and of course, there was a discussion, but these simulations do not show something completely new. Uh, of course, we can discuss, you know, how much is being offered, but, but the pattern that some border get more and some border get less was there at that time. So economic surplus increases, allocated capacities decrease, uh, you know, you can't have both. Uh, and there is a redistribution among the border. This, these three patterns we have shown at that time. So to us, they are not a surprise. And uh, uh, but we can still see that there are some improvements which are possible. So what we see that TSOs can still improve the level of capacities being offered. And we propose here a historical NTC as a benchmark, not not as a minimum capacity. But at least as a benchmark, so that so that we know that TSOs are offering a similar level, not something significant, significantly smaller. So we think this is one level of improvement we still can do. And of course, we fully support uh, the work and the ongoing uh, uh, effort to improve uh, solutions for collateral requirements. So we have made a temporary solution based on forward spreads. We know it's not perfect, but we think we can, you know, do it for a temporary transition period. But we still expect TSOs to and Java to work on a better solution based on this option three we were discussing about. So this these two improvements, these two elements still can be improved and should be improved. Uh, but it's too early today to conclude that, uh, you know, long-term flow base doesn't work after, you know, three months or six months of uh, testing. If we can uh, compare with uh, central west flow base or core flow based, uh, we had we had years of testing and fine tuning uh, and nobody concluded, that, no, look, let's stop because this doesn't work. We didn't conclude at that time that, that, that they had flow base doesn't work. We just said, okay, results are still not there. Let's continue improving but at the end we did it uh, so that's what that's why we are proposing for TSOs to continue testing fine-tuning and improving capacity allocation and test the allocation results uh, in parallel to implementation we would invite all parties to continue discussing possible further adjustments uh, but, but we want to be clear here that you know these adjustments you know cannot affect the implementation timelines uh, uh, because the existing obligations are applicable we are already in delays uh, so let's let's discuss those those uh, uh, possible adjustments uh, but knowing of course that uh, you know we cannot discuss them forever and we cannot challenge what's already legally applicable uh, yeah uh, that would be our proposed way forward knowing that now we have one additional year to get ready well one additional year for discussions on the impact let's uh, take very good use of this additional year to do additional testing additional fine-tuning additional discussions to be ready for next year I give the floor back to you, Zorad. 
thank you, thank you. That was the the last slide. We have collected quite a lot of. There was some noise. Um, quite a lot of uh, questions. I would now uh, read them. Uh, those with most votes, I would say, I would start with uh, in this order. Uh, for a couple of those first, first are for for Martin, but later we also have some uh, that uh, are for Jerome and Syriac, and so on. So you also see here the coordinates of our sliders, so you can add some some more. So um, the first one would be by Paul Gisberts. Basic question: A longer term allocation is about financial transmission rights. How can flow-based long-term allocation impacts welfare if actual physical allocation of cross-zonal capacity is only done at the ahead stage? Martin, please. Yeah. So uh, the the principle is that. Uh, you know, we had a discussion before, does more transmission right affect the prices of forward markets? And I hope we were able to convince that. So if you if we can allocate more capacities uh, on the borders which have a higher price difference, this will decrease the price differences, will increase the market integration in the reg region in the forward time frame. Increasing market integration means bringing prices closer together. And that always implies increase of economic surplus in the forward time frame. Uh, highest prices go down, lowest prices go a bit up. Uh, yeah, even though you know it's a it's a financial market, it's a FTRs, but still it enables consumers on average to buy cheaper futures. And producers to sell a bit more expensive futures. Thank you. From the same pot, but anonymous uh, contributor, where does this objective of lowering the price difference in the forward time frame come from? This effect would probably be very temporary. What is the objective behind this? Yeah, he, here I would I would point out that. You know, the whole purpose of uh, electricity market, of integrated electricity market, is to integrate the markets, so to bring markets closer together, to enable free trade. Free trade en enables, the, you know, the, the reduce price differences. Uh, this is the objective in all, all markets, also long-term markets. And I would, I could, I could reverse the question. So, what, what's the reason why not to? have this objective? Why would forward market be different in this regard? Why we should not integrate forward markets and bring them closer together? And and I would say that this effect is not temporary. If you look at you know economic arbitrage, uh, economic arbitrage, buying and selling in different markets, this this has a permanent effect on the price. It's not temporary effect. So you, you basically move supply and demand across the border. This is, this is not a temporary effect. Hey, uh, Eustus, um, for slide 37, I think it was your slide, Martin. Optimizing electricity flow in forward time frame allows consumers to buy cheaper and producers to sell more expensive. I don't see a link between forward trading and physical flows. Could you explain in more detail? Yeah. I would agree that these flows are not physical, so they are they are financial flows. Uh, FTRs are financial, but the volume that we are offering or TSOs are offering is limited by the physics. So it's limited by the physical capacity. So the, the, this is the relationship between the FTRs and physics is that FTRs are limited by the volume of flows that a network can accommodate. Uh, so if we can optimize these volumes, limited by the physical flows uh, and we can connect the markets which have higher price differences. We can increase price co price convergence in the forward, mar forward market. Uh, so in this sense, the, the financial markets and physical markets are, are linked by the volumes that we are offering. So we are not vo offering infinite volumes. We are offering something that is a percentage of actual physical 
capacity. Okay, um, another question. Um, anonymous, uh, LTT LTTR affects forward prices, but depressing forward spreads beyond expected spot spreads lowers total congestion income. I'm not sure if this is about uh, long-term congestion income or day ahead congestion income, by, by the way, which is bad for society and good for traders. Why is it presented as a positive thing? Or did I misunderstood something? Maybe to add a comment, if it's about the long-term congestion income, we see that with higher capacities, um, it's still not saturated. It it increases in the simulation that we and, and, uh, and the DSOs had. But Martin, you can contribute. Yeah. This somehow also, I think it's related to the new study we discussed before. Uh, so indeed, you know, if we ideally, you know, we, we would offer the same amount of volumes of LTTRs on a border that we, we can expect physical trade in the day ahead. This is, this is what they call a balanced market. So if you look at what will be the expected physical trade between France and Germany, in the ahead, we would need to offer a similar volume of LTTRs in the forward market. Uh, that, that that's their uh, key idea, and indeed that should be the the, the main principle. Uh, we should not sell too little. We should not sell too much. We should try to get similar volumes in the ahead and in in long term. Uh, so in this sense, if we can if we can do it just right, we would have neither under valuation, not over valuation. We would just have in forward market uh, exactly the same volume as we would expect in the, in the dead market. And because the ad market is flow based, you know, the ad market will allocate more imports exports to borders which have higher price differences. And the forward market must do the same, must do the same, the same amount of the same kind of opt optimization not to distort the forward prices. Uh, okay. Uh, um, there I, is. Could I, could I add a add a point on this one? Yes, please. Because um, they also mentioned mentioned traders. Um, may, maybe just a few things, and and we've talked a lot about price convergence in the last few questions. Um, so uh, a few things. So first, for us, like. So market integration is indeed an objective. Um, price convergence can be um, an indicator of, of greater market integration, but it is not necessarily an objective in itself. For us, like the objective is to have the right price signals, the right prices, not the same prices. Um, so, and that's an important distinction to make. Um, so of course, when markets are more linked, and we see that in the head uh, market coupling, um, there is a tendency towards greater price convergence at the times when the fundamentals are similar and there's great capacity available between the different markets. Um, so that's kind of to reset the stage from our perspective on, on, on the question of price convergence. Now to the question posed by, um, by, by the person. Um, so it's, it's not a question of depressing uh, forward spreads. Um, uh, forward transmission rights are there to create a link and, and what we observe is indeed usually after an auction of long-term transmission rights that there's a readjustment between this, the, the different markets. So the forward spreads usually after an auction has a tendency to decrease. Uh, but that's also a temporal effect. Uh, because forward markets are continuous markets and annual auctions, for instance, happen once. Um, and whether this is, means a cost for society because lower congestion rent and stuff like this uh, and greater benefits for traders, um, that's not quite the case, I believe. Um, the, the amount of congestion rent that will be collected by the TSOs can completely depend from border to border. Um, and the effects like ex post effects um, on the forward price spreads um, will indeed be after the auction itself. So after the congestion rent has been collected like in, in that time frame. Um, and also final remark, this is without prejudice of 
um, how the spreads are going to look like in day ahead and intraday. Um, just because it's far in advance of real time, the forward market is just an expectation of what will happen in the day ahead market um, for the market itself, for the market participants themselves, but also for the TSOs. Hence also the types of margins that the TSOs take long in advance of real time. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question, maybe also briefly for Martin to comment. Consumers, grid users paying most of the grid tariffs will not be happy with zero capacity on board despite paying for interconnectors, just for increasing social welfare elsewhere. There is then a problem regarding the allocation of costs to those parties benefiting from this interconnection. Maybe this question is far reaching and uh, takes the results of uh, long term flow based allocation statically because today the one border can be zero tomorrow, another depending on the on the needs. And this is also possible uh, and and expected from the long term flow based allocation. But Martin, maybe you can provide mm. more details. Maybe we need it, it's good that we have an open discussion. So uh, Jerome, if you have any uh, other views, please feel free to, or any anybody from TSOs. Uh, uh, the discussion is open, so it doesn't have to be only me <laughs> providing these uh, responses. Uh, in my view, so this question is, uh, you know, questioning a bit the the purpose of internal market. So in in the internal market, there are always winners and losers. So if you collect markets, there will be some consumers who who will pay higher price and some producers who will get lower price. Uh, and there will be sometimes network being used purely for import or export. So internal market does tempor temporarily lead to some winners and losers. But what we have decided in Europe that we will still build this market because on average, on average across longer time frame, we all benefit from it. Uh, we all benefit. You know, one time there will be scarcity in France. Everybody, everybody helps to deliver energy in, in France, but then in, in another time there will be scarcity maybe, maybe in Germany or Poland. Prices will go up and down. So if you think that you know you only care about yourself, this this may be okay in that in the moment when you have a low price. But when you have a low price, of course everybody wants to have open market uh, and uh, and other 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 markets supporting that market which is facing a scarce situation. Maybe on this one, a uh, uh, compliment. Um, but yeah, that's the objective. Um, and I think the objective is the, the greater common good. Um, but we know in, in, in other debate also, um, what's different, like like the, the difference between equality and, and equity. Um, and indeed, I think it's a fair question um, whether um, consumers, but generally society that, that um, has contributed to the development of interconnection and sees no access to that interconnection before or little access before before the day had time frame they can ask themselves that question and and that's i think that's exactly why we bring um the, the, those this concern um to the table um and it's like fundamentally not just a question of equity um it's also a question of how like, have we looked at um, all the elements? And, and and I agree with you, Martin, this is a tricky part to quantify those. But have we looked at all the added value, like including a side and outside of the flow based auction um, of providing long term transmission rights to uh, to market participants? So so for us, those questions are important um, and indeed shouldn't be neglected. And we have put in place um, similar patches um, for different um, features of our uh, electricity markets um, to make sure that where we see um, like strong imbalances in how um, costs and benefits are distributed, that this is um, readjusted. Okay, um, thank you. Another question, uh, so feel free to comment both or anybody else who, who would like to comment can raise a uh, hand and I will uh, open the, the mic. 
Uh, you need to consider carefully uh, if the objective function for the flow based allocation is correct. If the expected spread between two countries is low, a player will not pay a high price for the capacity. However, the hedge may still hi have high value for the player. This is something that is often mentioned by the market participants. Indeed, so I I would say that there are two components in you know in in the forward prices and prices of transmission capacity. One is the expectation of the forward spread or forward price, and the other is the risk premium, which somehow re reflects the expected volatility as well as it's the attitude towards the risk that you have. So even if the price is zero, you may Value value volatility quite high, and you, you know you want to hedge against volatility, and you will offer non-zero risk premium, high risk risk premium for the capacity, and you might still get capacity based purely on the risk premium. Uh, on the other hand, if you value both risk premium and expected price difference at zero, I would tend to argue in this case you don't need such capacity. Because then, in, then, it, then the proxy hedging. So, if you want to, if you want to hedge in Germany and you're based, I don't know, in in Belgium, if you if you price both the expected price difference zero and the risk premium at zero, then I, I would argue that hedging only in Germany, only in Germany, is good enough. Maybe I'll yeah. add to this. Um... I, I would say that indeed, like uh, as Martin said, there the two components. Um, we've been uh, it's a struggle to make sure to put numbers on it. Um, we very much welcome some of the some of the the, the diagrams you presented, Martin, earlier. Um, we we'd we'd love to understand uh, like how like how they've been calculated and everything. And I'm sure this this can be this can be part of an interesting discussion. Um, but yeah, this. This is what those rights are for um, as well. Not not just the the difference between markets, but how how they evolve compared to each other over time, um, and included how sometimes um, it, it may be beneficial um, to secure transmission rights for a few hours or just for a few days um, in the year where that volatility is extreme. So. OK, um, maybe one brief uh, organizational question for Syriac. Can the uh, raw flow based data used for the simulations uh, that you explained be made publicly available? Syriac, uh, maybe you can reply to that. Um, for now, we had uh, the question for, from Ether and we we've sent these. Uh, uh, we, uh, we've sent you these, uh, these data the, this week. Uh, we can come back to, to to you for for this question because uh, I will need first to align with the other TSO to to be sure it's okay mm -hmm. for everyone. Okay, so but this is about publicly available. So yeah, that's exactly. That's the point. Okay, I see. Uh, thank you. So just I just on this, can, yeah, please. Yes, thank you. Uh, just on this, so Ellen speaking. Um, this is not a, a new question. Huh? So it's more than one year ago that we are asking to have the publication of the domain used for the simulation. So we would really welcome uh, a quick feedback on this and uh, and uh, the, 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 pu the publication of the data. So please, uh, if you can answer quite quickly, it would be great. Yeah, I uh, I take the point. I don't know, Jim, if you have more more info on, the, on that one, but uh, we, we will uh, come back to you quite quickly. Yeah, that, that's my message. We will revert as soon as possible, Lynn. Thank you very much. OK. Thank you. Uh, Selim, please. Yeah, Selim Busteta for your electric. Uh, I, I, I'm just jumping in in the, this discussion. Uh, I think this also applies to uh, the results presented by Acer. Uh, to some extent, there are some quantitative analysis uh, in the presentation that are, was very valuable to see. But if we, if you could share the results with us so that we can uh, yeah, have an equal footing on that, uh, see see uh, 
So this is what we have the hypothesis and the data behind, uh, and, and maybe have further discussion on. That. Thank you very much. Um, yes, indeed. Well, we think that we shared quite a lot of information during the referral. However, we definitely did not share the domain. Did we consider this data as, uh, let's say, the TSOs are the owners? So. Uh, TSO's answer would also reflect on our answer if if it's in other words if it's available from TSO's it will also be available from ASER. Mm. The, yeah. the, the, the domains, but also uh, there was a uh, slides on the uh, correlation of price and volatility, uh, price pattern volatility. Yeah. We we will share that uh, we will share that data. We will also uh, insist that TSO's also share this data as soon as possible. Uh, so we need to have maximum transparency. Uh, yeah, uh, Steve, I see you and I just wanted to invite you actually because there are your two questions. Maybe you can provide them uh, orally and comment whatever you would like on top of that. Yeah, so um, nothing to hide with, with the domains. Uh, question noted, and, and we will uh, formalize it then next week uh, on core TSO side. Um, indeed, needed to have transparency on it. Um, I raised a few questions in the chat, but I don't want to cut the line, so I'm, I trust that you will pick them up when you go through them one by one, and then if needed, I will further react. You are there. That, they are just on the line because I'm I'm listing them on the on the based on number of votes, so you are quite high. So there's your question to Jerome. Uh, do you agree that minimum ATC upon long term flow based allocation is not a quick win? Martin's input and questionable as target solution as LTFVA, a key question to look into in EMDR. If you choose, put effort in this transitional solution the coming years or in longer maturities, more frequent auctions. That, that's a really good question. Um, so first, maybe I, I'd like to insist again on the fact that we're not suggesting that we need to have minimum ATCs in a specific kind of format, et cetera. Like those are things that like we presented one perspective using one metric, thinking about how we want to implement that and making sure that there's minimum volumes available at each border. That's um, that that. That's what's in, important for us um, and to be decided collectively um, how we implement that. Uh, now, um, if I need to choose and um, between that and long term maturity of transmission rights um, and do I agree this is not a quick win? I don't know. I don't know how much work is needed to implement that. Um, I don't know if it's just a simple tweak um in the Java tool like if you're below that level re-increase and readjust I don't know if it's just a, a simple IT tweak or this needs like 12 months of work um I'm surprised also by the need to modify so many um regulations on network code and stuff like this um but so so yes possibly it takes time possibly it takes resources that are taken at the same time um Ideally, I want both at the same. I want long term transmission rights, multi year transmission rights, um, and ensuring that minimum capacity levels are allocated at all borders. Um, yes. Um, how, what does it take? How long does it take to implement each project? That's something that, um, that we would need to better understand. Yeah, and then I would dare to claim that the current way of issuing LTTRs is satisfying your your demand already. So for me, this is much more about the in the five coming years, uh, because Martin is right, be, before we have a new regulation enshrined uh, in implement, implementing act and then having methodologies implementation, we are looking at the five year time frame where we will be discussing first really the fundamentals of of the objective of issuing LTTRs and uh, what I take away from this debate here is that there are different views around the table. If taking long term flow based allocation as an assumption is a viable assumption or not, I believe we need to further discuss that. And, and then we need to start thinking what can we do in the coming years? And what I see popping up in a debate are 
some no regret IDs. Maybe we didn't discuss it explicitly here today, but in previous uh, sessions as well uh, on these longer maturities on more frequent auctions. Um, and also a, a big signal that we will need to look into a statistical approach. And then we're putting, putting that together. There is for me still a, a nice big package to develop in the coming years whilst we are figuring out the objective function. And this package, we can already start applying it and looking into with, with the current way of working. We do not necessarily have to switch in the meanwhile to, to a flow-based world, but we have to choose where we want to put our, our efforts in and, and which regulatory track we want to follow in the coming years. Thank you. Another Steve's question was the low zero allocation effect is demonstrated and is there even when doubling the min RAM requirement for the LTCCM from 20% to 40%. Uh, do you agree that using historical capacities as benchmark is moving us into statistical approach uh, just as moving into longer maturities would do? I would say that uh, this effect of increasing min RAM is also changing a bit the picture. So we, we can indeed see that uh, the, there's higher, generally higher capacity, which is allocated. Also, uh, it still depends on the security level. Uh, even with 40% of min RAM, which is flatly uh, applied across the core regions, according at least to ASUS previous uh, analysis, and we hope that TSOs will provide similar ones, we are still not on the uh, on the level of capacities allocated through NTCs. So uh, on the higher security levels, uh, 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 on the higher security levels, of course, that some capacities are lower in, in allocation. So it means that uh, TSOs are uh, keen on providing more capacity when it's implicit, when it's not obvious over connect. So we would also invite TSOs to analyze this, this effect. And still there can be some uh, low values at the end because it depends on the function, uh, on, the, on, the, uh, on the algorithm. However, this is not only a competition among borders, this is also a competition, still competition among bids, the bids who provides high uh, value would get will get best on any any border so that is that is possible uh, regarding the statistical approach indeed uh, as martin explained previously i think also on slide 71 we are we are considering a statistical approach uh, but uh, a benchmark of ntc would not be an absolute one because we know that some of the values are really high and maybe arbitrarily defined so that would be mainly just a, a light benchmark, let's say. Maybe uh, Martin can contribute, and I see Jerome's hand raised. Jerome, please. please. Yeah. yeah, I think, I mean, this poses also back to a fundamental question for us. Um, and, and the question of min rams is different from potentially applying, for instance, um, minimum volume in the allocation process. This really poses the fundamental question, what's the added value of the flow-based capacity calculation and what's the value of a single um, regional flow-based auction? So the allocation part and, and, and those elements probably need to be like, like disentangled um, to really see the added value of the different elements in the chain. Um, and, and also when we talk about NTC, like what is it we're talking about is it just the allocation part um and which elements come into play and which limiting elements come into play in the calculation before that um so all those things and that probably takes time i agree um in terms of studying and 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 making sure that we use the right element that actually do um provide like a significant increase in economic efficiency um and whatever um is more um, not irrelevant, but it has a more limited impact um, and is sensitive um, that we make sure we find the right tools to make sure it's um, it's properly efficient down the line. Yeah, and I, I fully acknowledge there are two elements in this debate, the allocation function debate, and then there is the uh, the capacity calculation methodology debate. 
what we have in hand is a decided upon methodology with 20% requirement inside, not with 30, 40, or even more. So if we, if we go in this direction, then we are going to reinitiate a regulatory track on the capacity calculation methodology. Um, I, I'm not against this, but we have to realize, as you said, Jerome, this, this will take time as well to, to settle. And, and we, we need to look into these type of questions also with statistically. So for, for me, these, these are all signals that, that these things will, will take time, whatever path we will follow. Um, and then it becomes important also to to shed some light on the way forward, or, or, or also for the allocation project here, um, because yeah, then there needs to be a, a common basis for for TSOs for Jao to to really move forward with this implementation and not deliver something that is not desired, that is not going to be welcomed. Um, so this is now the time to to reflect on the way forward so as, aside from the implementation uh it requirement issue the, the the real need is there to to define the way forward and i think we need to also agree on the process how we will how we'll continue this debate because out of today's discussion obviously we we maybe have scoped a bit to the questions and and the playground uh, but we didn't have we don't have conclusions for me to move forward so we need to also discuss uh, here the process. Okay. Uh, Selim, please. Yes, uh, again, Selim was that for your electric. Um, I have to say I fully agree with what Steve just said, uh, but maybe maybe before that, a quick general word on today's uh, workshop um, uh, to say that uh, First, we welcome the presentation from NSOE, uh, specifically all the insights and, and quantitative information uh, that uh, that was included. Uh, this was uh, quite uh, quite interesting, and we we definitely uh, will be looking uh, into the specifics uh, in the coming days to to discuss uh, the conclusion to draw from it. Uh, we also very much welcome the presentation from NSOE side. Uh, of course, we can mark some some disalignments here and there, and we probably will do uh, in the next steps. But uh, but we do recognize its value. We do recognize that's a rather comprehensive presentation uh, with with interesting information. Uh, but most importantly, if I may say, what what uh, what we do value is to see that some openness to discuss uh, the the way forward uh, and to take market participants' input into account uh, and and. Uh, sort of getting out uh, of the dead end, dead end, sorry, where we currently stand. Uh, uh, and, and now to come back on on, on Steve's point, uh, how, how we see things, I guess, is first, uh, we should continue the discussion, we should continue the, to exchange on the details, uh, to have a level playing field, if I may say, um, uh, to have um, um, a common uh, understanding and a common uh, level of access to information. Uh, so, so we would be keen for that to to, and I insist on this again because this has been a point for years now. Uh, would be keen on having access to the data uh, that is behind the information that was presented today, uh, so that we can also uh, appropriate uh, the results and the conclusion to be drawn out of it, uh, and 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 maybe bring our own stone to the to the wall. Well, um, and, and also sometimes on clarifying the, the dissensus that we may have heard uh, on the interpretation to give to those results uh, uh, between between Acer and, and SOE. Um, so that would be the first point. We also, I think, uh, given what we heard from here and there and the questions, we should discuss the objectives to pursue. Uh, we had this uh, this um, uh, this remark on the welfare creation. Uh, so as far as LTTRs are concerned, there is no direct welfare creation, just a, a redistribution of surplus. Uh, so, so is it welfare that we're seeking? Is it uh, are we looking at this distribution and and its effects? Uh, and 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 uh, the case might be what what is what do we consider uh, acceptable in terms of redistribution? Uh, and and same for the price conversion conversions. There there is no 
uh, so far there is no consensus on the fact that it's really uh, what we we should be aiming for. Uh, but uh, but there is a discussion uh, on on whether or not that's an objective. Uh, there are also on the on the matters to be discussed the questions on the collateral and the question on the comp competition between borders, uh, which which is tightly linked in fact to the to the redistrib redistribution uh, of uh, of surplus that I was mentioning. Uh, but uh, but yeah, uh, again coming back to Steve's points. Uh, um we should really set uh, the discussion on the way forward uh, at, uh, on the short term if i may say uh, uh, acer has recalled uh, in its presentation the the sequence of events that led us to the current situation it has uh, values to to remind us of that uh, but one event that is missing uh, i think in this uh, in this uh, uh, in this presentation, uh, and which is a game changer, is is the uh, EMD revision, uh, uh, and more specifically the impact assessment from the Commission uh, that will seek to redefine the target, uh, the target model for the long term, and and that really uh, puts a different perspective on all what everything we're doing on, on on the short term. So so I think we really need to account for that, uh, and and. But I hear also from this, from the discussions and some interventions that some lines may have uh, changed uh, on, on on both sides on SS side on on TSO side so so that should be accounted for. Um, um, so yeah, uh, and I, I, I guess I'll, I'll end like this. Uh, this clearly doesn't mean that uh, this discussion clearly doesn't mean that we should stop the work. We should put the pen down. Uh, I, I think that's, that's the fear uh, that I hear from, from some interventions. Uh, for me, it, it's clearly not what is in front of us. Uh, we, we probably should be taking twice as many pens as we are today. Uh, in fact, uh, to, to, to answer to all the questions that have been raised today, uh, to, uh, and that's the Commission's work, but we, we should uh, support the Commission on that to, to redefine the, the target model. Um, uh, there there's a lot of work to be conducted. Uh, I'm not sure it's going to be uh, possible within the one year span that, that we're looking at on, 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 uh, in terms of delay for the flow-based implementation. Uh, we probably will need at least a good part of it uh, just to define where we are heading uh, and to work maybe on the solutions uh, that can be implemented to, uh, to get around some of the challenges uh, that the, that the flow-based uh, is, is raising. Uh, uh, and and but that's okay. Uh, if we if we need a few more months uh, or a few more years to implement something that is robust, uh, I think it's it's definitely uh, worth it, and and we should definitely consider it. Thank you. Thank you, Celine. Maybe, maybe just a few. Uh, that is always a. Uh, a dilemma, uh, you know, when we are starting a new legislation, uh, will you affect the existing uh, requirements? Because, you know, with old regulation is still being implemented, CAC and uh, guidance team is still being implemented, and we are when you are opening a new legislation, people will say, okay, let's stop everything we are doing, let's wait for the new legislation. That's a trap I think we should not fall into. Uh, uh, so the new, new legislation has different timelines. Uh, the timeline is, I, I said before, at least six and a half years, at least. It's, it's very optimistic. Uh, so old regulation must continue. Uh, new regulation is being prepared. Uh, we can see if there is if there are some, let's say, uh, dead ends. Uh, so for example, if we invest into something which will not be used under new legislation, we can perhaps discuss about them. But if the old regulation is in the direction of the new discussions, I would not see the need to stop the, the implementation of the old regulation, as long as it's broadly aligned with the steps of the new regulation. Thank you, Martin. Michael, please. Yes, thank you. So Michal von Bossart uh, speaking for IFIEC Europe, the industrial consumers. Um, I've been following the discussion uh, with great interest, and I'm not going to say things that Martin already knows, uh, but, but we already had this discussion in the past. Um, for industrial consumers, 
the long-term capacity and also long-term cross-border capacity is very important in order to ensure hedging, and that's what we know from the past. But also we are facing massive investments in, I mean, plans from the Commission say we're going to develop the North Sea as one big wind farm, and we will have to bring develop capacity to bring that um, energy on land, but not just in, this, in, the, in the member states uh, bordering the North Sea, but also further away, and the same for the Baltic and the same for the Mediterranean. I mean, we will have to develop massively uh, grid, um, but also make sure that that capacity, uh, windmill capacity or whatever capacity is being built, and it requires massive investments. And one of the uh, roads that is being looked at is um, PPAs, and there are many others being looked at. Now, for industrial consumers, and I think for consumers in general, if you want to make sure that an investment where you partake in and that they put really money on the table, and we're talking about billions, that you can bring that energy to where you need it, uh, you have to have some certainty that uh, the cross-border capacity is there in order to allow you. And not just financially hedging, but also making sure that, that, that there's physical capacity, uh, that the energy is there, because with a financial uh, instrument, and now I'm really talking for industry, if the energy is not there, your plant is not running, eh? even if you're financially covered, but in the end, eh, the capacity has to be there. I've been looking at all the discussions on, on welfare eh? and, 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 and the simulation showing that some countries then have uh, zero capacity in long term under the new approach. Um, that's going to be very difficult to explain to a consumer in Belgium or the Netherlands, eh, where we had on both borders and zero capacity in the long term, that they have to invest massively in grids, that they will get some money back through congestion income, uh, but that they will not be able to hedge themselves because there's no long term capacity on their borders. Although they need to also uh, sign PPAs, they also need to do all these kind of things. And so in the end, the end goal should not be, and, and I know some people will not like me, I'm not a lawyer, so I can say those things. Eh? The law is something that you need to make sure that you obtain a goal. It's not a goal in itself. Eh? And so indeed, Martin, we have to work on current legislation to make sure that it is very efficient. We have to work on future legislation, but we really have to keep in mind the end goal, and that is make, make sure that the energy transition is being done at the, 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 the most efficient way. And so... Looking at all the discussions here, I'm not even going to go in all the details, but speaking for consumers, I can only say that we hope that everybody still keeps the focus. It is not just, uh, and Najerov is going to be angry, about trading, because that's just arbitrage. But as a consumer and as a producer, but I'm not representing producers, so that's not really my direct concern, it is to make sure that in an efficient way we can transport uh, energy uh, across Europe, but also make sure that everybody can take positions that all those PPAs and all the projects that are related to, to those can be realized. And so it's it's really important to 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 make sure that that uh, goal is looked at. And so zero capacity on on in the long term on certain borders is very difficult to explain it to consumers in those member states that also have to pay for all the grid capacity. And so really take that into account uh, because otherwise you will lose support for all this. And I think this is very important. The long term is a very essential building block to make sure that we go to market integration and not just market coupling. Hey, I've had it, we have had this discussion so many times and Martin, I see you smiling, but we had this discussion so many times, uh, but it's really, it's fundamental. I mean, otherwise you lose support from, from those people that are actually trying to help. And I'm going to stop here, but uh, but I really want to make this point also that it's beyond the technical discussions we're having uh, today. Thank you. Okay. I think as Steve, as Steve mentioned uh, in, in one of the comments, uh, yeah, we need to have more in-depth discussions. Uh, Maybe in smaller circles uh, of interested interested parties. Uh, uh, so these workshops are nice, but uh, you know maybe we need to go deeper into certain certain problems, and uh, we will certainly discuss with TSOs uh, and anyways how to how to deepen these discussions and make them more effective. Uh, Yeah, just a quick comment. We're we're very much welcome that um, that initiative, Martin, uh, on the way forward, uh, because I think that's what also what Steve said earlier. I mean, we we need to to align on on what what should be done, what can be done. Uh, so thanks for the initiative, Martin. Okay, uh, Steve, as this was triggered by your comment. Uh, maybe you can contribute, or you consider that it's answered. 
it's fully answered by Jim. So uh, I I really actually like the the presentations today, the uh, the way how topics are being connected, um, and 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 insights are put on the table. So I I, I personally I, I found it a very successful workshop, and I'm happy to to feel the openness to go more in depth in a workshop. So thanks for for organizing this in the first place today. Thank you. And we are not yet done. OK, so uh, uh, another question related to uh, Martin's example from slides 4041 anonymous. I don't know the provider. So how come uh, how come can you conclude this does not mean to LTTR under evaluation when the cleared price under LTFBA is so far away from the traded market price at the time? Germany France spread value at 74.5 euros per, me per megawatt hour, leading to 612 million euros congestion income loss, also consumers' money. Yeah, uh, the reason why why I say this is that you know here we are comparing spread forward spread under on the information set that we have NTC allocation. Uh, but if you would have flow based allocation, the information set changes. Uh, this means that market participants will know in advance that, OK, this allocation will give more capacity to this border. They will take that information into account. They will adjust their bidding and the forward spread will reduce even before the auction results are known. Uh, and will reduce uh you know to the point and then when the auction comes it will the forward the forward spread will be reduced and the difference between the forward spread and the auction result will be much lower uh, and after the auction uh there will also be a adjustment to take into account for the difference between the expectation and realized auction uh, results so this is you know that's that's how the dynamics of the continuous auction uh, and the information expectation works. Uh, but the forward spread under flow based environment will not be as high. Okay, thank you. In, if anyone wants to uh, provide the feedback, just raise raise your hand. Otherwise, another question for Martin. Um, Considering your point on LTTRs needing to support hedging within illiquid zones, can you elaborate on how you see the low availability of LTTRs from less liquid to more liquid zones under LTFVA? Yeah, I would have the same the same response as the last time. So market participants bid for transmission rights based on expected spot price or expected spread, spot spread and risk premium. So if both if both of these two have zero value, we would argue that in this case, participants don't need transmission rights because proxy hedge, uh, like, like hedging in Germ Germany, is perfectly fine without having a transmission right. Transmission, you need transmission right where proxy hedge is not good enough and, and your local price is has a, a low correlation to the to the proxy hedge, but this happens only when there is significant price difference or high volatility of the price difference. And if that happens, you will have you will you will offer much more for this capacity. So, uh, in short term, so when you need transmission rights, flow based will provide it to you. When you don't need it, flow based will not provide it to you. Or, or maybe I can correct myself. Those who need it more will get it more. <laughs> Those who need it less will get it less. Jerome, please. Yeah, maybe, maybe I'll add one reflection to that. Um, so, so this may, like, what you mentioned, and and in the context of what we're tr like, what the the long-term flow is auction is trying to optimize. Um, 
that may be that may be largely true. Um, one of the things that we could observe in uh, in, in the TSO simulation um, is that there there is a large increase of capacities allocated, um, especially around Germany. So for like uh, to and from the liquid hub, uh, the most liquid hub in Europe uh, for electricity for trading. Um, one of the concerns and when you look at like the capacity between borders, which are like bit like between rather illiquid zones, um, like that's where we see a, like a significant drop in capacity and and that may be a concern um, in terms not only of, of the proxy hedging in the liquid hub, but um, like for those who try um, to hedge a, for instance, a physical position, not not fundamentally proxy hedging, but a physical position between two zones that are themselves rather illiquid. Um, so so there and for that purpose um, and bearing in mind that long term transmission rights are there in, in that Article 9 of uh, of the FC guideline indeed to provide cross border hedging risk and um and sus and and kind of boost also liquidity within bidding zones um that may be a concern um in terms of the liquidity of those local zones um so so i think what you say martin is is indeed partially true um at least part of the question part of the like the other part of the question out um and especially around um for for zones between between rather liquid zones and how in that case the absence of LTTRs um, indeed not necessarily conducive to um, to boosting liquidity there. Let's discuss uh, a, a side question when uh, Jerome is here from uh, Vincent. Where, when will the inside study be published? Um, so, so yeah, it's a, it's a lot of simulations, a lot of tables, etc. Um, our our um, consultants at at Insight, uh, Mehdi and Eve, uh, Eve Langi and Mehdi Madani, who are also on the call, um, have been doing some uh, some summary presentations um, that that would be um, would be happy to share with those who want. Um, to make sure that we produce um, something that is um, is really accessible and fully understand for everybody, um, that we may need to uh, we may need to look into that a little bit more. But um, if you're um, if you're interested, don't hesitate to contact us, um, and we'll see at what level of, of of depth you want to have information. So so don't hesitate to send me an email, j.lepage at ifed.org. Okay, uh, there's a, there's Steve's question to Martin. Maybe also Steve can jump in, but I'll read it. Uh, um, do we even need coordination when moving to firm LTTRs not impacting short term markets? That means no LTA inclusion. It is about the balance in LTTRs between providing hedging and using congestion income to cover it. Liquidity needed need can differ from bidding zone to bidding zone, and hence could risk profile and erase TSOs are after. Steve, maybe you can explain. Yeah, so if we put away, if we put aside for a moment the question on integrating forward markets competition, driving a need for coordination, um, what is then the need still out there um, today? Yeah, it's it's on TSO side a lot inspired by the fact that we make the LTTRs a physical reality by the technique of LTA inclusion, which is uh, linked to you know the keeping the balance of of how um, you use the congestion income versus the payouts, the whole revenue adequacy story. Um, but if and I believe it will be part of the impact assessment. If we in this discussion are looking into going to a firm product with LTTRs, um, and we are open to discuss this operational link 
So not having NFT inclusion anymore, then it becomes a purely purely financial link to make sure that on average you don't oversell compared to the capacity that you capture in day ahead. And and then probably there's still some room, you know, to uh, to nuance uh, based on what is the hedging need, how is the hedging need evolving uh, from one bidding zone to the other, because the liquidity is also different and so forth. So again, putting aside this this effect of competition and taking away the operational impact on short-term markets, is there still a question if there's still a fundamental need to go for a coordinated approach? Maybe you don't have the answer right away and you have to think about it and come back to it in the in-depth workshop. That's also fine. And that, again, referring to the new study, so what they point out is that, you know, if if in the debt market, France is importing, I don't know, uh, on average one gigawatt of energy from Germany, ideally we should only allocate one gigawatt of transmission rights on that border. So uh, even if you don't care about physics anymore and you say it's all financial, uh, you know, uh, we only look at the revenue adequacy for TSOs, we still need to be careful not to sell too much or too little. We try to mimic what will happen in the day market. Uh, that would be, I would confirm that to you. Uh, Yeah, and I think there can be a debate on on that aspect. Um, maybe Helena, you have your hands raised. Yes, I thank you for the this interesting idea. I think we really should uh, should uh, look at that and uh, reflect on that, especially with the coming impact assessments. Uh, I think just to be sure, I understand you. When you say get rid of the physique, you don't mean selling anything uh, without any link to the physique. You mean um, that. On Indeed. an hourly basis, you don't need a strict one-to-one -one link that will be ensured by the LTA, but you mean that on average you will stick to values like Martin was saying, like uh, what with, which are online uh, with what you observe in in the day ahead, right? Indeed. So that's 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 okay. part of the okay. of the reflection indeed to have. Do we need to stick to the current ID of hourly revenue adequacy? Um, or do we open the reflection? I think we can open the reflection because yeah. in the end, it's all about how you uh, use and the congestion income, which is somehow yeah. belonging to society for making yeah. hedging possible and increasing liquidity, which should also come at the benefit of society at some point. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and there I raise the question, is it, do we, are we after really a harmonization of the risk profiles or, or not? Um, I don't have the yeah, answer, but I, I just see the no, question no, popping I, I, up. I think it's a good question, and I wanted to echo what Martin you just said. Uh, it did not escape my my uh, my interest because you said we need then to be sure that we don't sell too much. Uh, fully agree, but you also said that we don't sell too little, and that's precisely uh, the whole point of our presentation with uh, Energy Traders Europe that we wanted to attract the attention that. Today, there is really too much focus on maximizing the auction surplus in a, in a, in a pure uh, flow-based way, which has as a consequence that some border actually, there is nothing to sell. So there is capacity offered, but at the end, market parties get nothing. So as a matter of fact, nothing is sold. So I really think that the consequence of that pure uh, surplus maximization maximization approach is that uh, sometimes we sell too little. Uh, and I think it would be a very good idea indeed to, to discuss, uh, to bring this uh, optimization function discussion, maybe not getting into the mathematical detail, but see, do, do we really want to stick to this pure uh, maximization of the surplus or do we allow ourselves some deviation, some uh, uh, some distance to this, uh, to this strict application so that we at least uh, ensure that uh, we don't sell too much for sure, but we also don't sell too little.
Yeah, thank you. Let me take just one more question, maybe, and then we would slowly wrap up. We have two more minutes to that to that point. Uh, maybe this from Paul, uh, unless already answered. Sorry if this is so. Martin said that the principle that forward prices are based on expected spot prices is correct. But he also said that because of different views among market participants on expected spot prices, this would there would be some effect. I don't understand this effect. Can it be explained? Yeah, uh, I would say if if all participants in Germany would have the same expectation of the expected spot price in Germany, we would we would see bid ask bid ask curves in the EEX futures completely flat. So all of them would have the same bids and the same asks, the same the same uh, bid based bids and the same asks. But they don't. So the, the you know the bid does spread does uh in, are increasing with uh, uh or they are tilted slightly. And this exactly represents that they they do expect the German price to be different. They have different expectations. Uh, uh, and that's why you know that's why if you allocate more capacity between the two borders, you enable those different expectations on one side to meet the different expectations on the other side. And this, and you move supply from one border to the other border or demand from one border to the other border, to the other zone. And by that, you change the, 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 the actual settlement price on, on one or the both sides of the border. Uh, I think the, the the key is that uh, there is not one single expectation. Uh, if there would be one single expectation of the spot price, then indeed the spot price would not change whatever we do with transmission rights. But there isn't one single expectation. There are many, many of them. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we are eleven fifty sharp. I don't know if there are some last comments or questions. If not, then I would maybe thank you for the participation. So many questions and I hope also answers. Also regarding the organization of discussion, I hope that uh, Steve is now more satisfied because we only initiated the discussion over Slido. It's not easy to control the discussion with 200 or more people, which was the maximum today. And uh, we moved a bit towards the the uh, the oral discussion. And as 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 mentioned and agreed, we will continue discussing further on. I would now hand over to Christoph maybe to provide a wrap up this last few minutes. Thank you, Zoran, and uh, thank you to all the, the participants. This was a, a, a very interesting uh, discussion in, done in a happy way, surprisingly, because uh, I know that there is a lot of frustration on all uh, sides, including from us. But uh, I appreciate that the, the, the discussion was um, was done in a happy way. Um, before maybe um, sharing with you my main takeaway of this uh, of this webinar, maybe a, a step back first. Um, I think that we have passed, or Jim, TSOs uh, have passed very quickly on the, the reason for the delay. And uh, I think that uh, we will have, when I say we, I mean NRAs, uh, ACER together with NRAs, I think we'll have to, to spend a bit more time to really understand the, the reason for this delay. I think this deserves uh, a, a more in-depth investigation from, from our side. Uh, now we have uh, this delay. We are uh, Maybe this is a, an heavy for the good. Uh, let's try to use this delay uh, in the best way possible uh, and try to, 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 to discuss and to, to, to address uh, some uh, uh, remaining issues. Um, from all the presentation, uh, there is for me one new element which uh, I, I like a lot and that, that uh, in my view also needs to be uh, uh, further discussed is uh, these two slides about the, the high correlation between the spreads and the, the annual spread and the, and the volatility. Uh, because 
to my understanding, this uh, this this is the the one of the key reasons uh, why why um, uh, be behind the, the 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 main concern of uh, of market participants. So I, I would um, welcome further discussion uh, on this uh, on this specific issue. So my main takeaway, the first one is. Uh, um, uh, I understand that some would like to to put this project uh, on pause uh, and and uh, and and focus on uh, on uh, um, on discussion at conceptual level. For me, this is a this is a no go. Uh, we 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 need to focus on the implementation of this project. Okay, we have a delay, but we sh we we need to focus on on the on the implementation. And for me, this would be completely unacceptable to wait. After 2030, to have a coordinated capacity calculation methodology and, and, and allocation. So let's focus on the implementation, and uh, this would be my first uh, uh, takeaway. Let's keep on focusing on the on the implementation. The second one, I, and I think this is an, a no controversial one, is the transparency of data. From our side, we have absolutely no issue to share uh, all the data that we have uh, with uh, with stakeholders. And I hope uh, it will be the same for, for TSOs. Uh, I hope they will be able to come back on this uh, very quickly. The third uh, takeaway is maybe it's, it's a, a concern uh, with the, the, the TSOs presentation. Uh, and uh, I think this was uh, uh, highlighted by, by, by Martin is that when presenting the, 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 the result of the simulation, we, we sometimes fail to understand what is the effect Due to the the, the the capacity offered to uh, by, by TSOs, from the effect of the of the 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 flow based allocation itself, and I think this introduces a bias and 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 a lot of confusion in the discussion. So I would welcome in the future if TSO could uh, clearly separate these two effects, so as to avoid uh, confusion. The fourth uh, uh, takeaway is about collateral. Here also, I think there is a, a, a broad agreement that we need to, to, to address this issue properly. And maybe the, the delay, the one year delay that we have, uh, will uh, should uh, be used to, to, to find a proper solution to, to, to this issue. And regarding the, the last point, uh, um, the, the, the key point in my view, the, the, what uh, Jérôme uh, called the, the the fair access of uh, uh, to long-term transmission right at all uh, borders. By the way, I don't really like this uh, this uh, this uh, this term fair access to to of uh, at all uh, uh, core borders because to me, if TSOs are able to offer <laughs> the capacity, this is. There is fair access. We can guarantee a fair access. It, the problem is more in the allocation of this uh, of this capacity. Uh, so regarding this uh, this uh, this this problem of um, uh, competition between borders, again the the the, the key issue of uh, the key concern raised by uh, by stakeholders. So this is not a new one. Uh, we have discussed this uh, concern a lot. Of course, we leave it. We will leave it to the European Commission to decide whether they want to include uh, this aspect in the in their impact assessment. Um, whether they want to address to 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 check to assess the benefit of uh, moving to a, a long-term flow-based uh, methodology. So we leave leave it to the, the European Commission. But from us, and I think you understood uh, from this webinar, but. Uh, also from our past decision, we are convinced that this competition between borders is a, a core feature of the uh, forward uh, capacity allocation and, and, uh, and a kind of no regret measure. We are fully aware of the concern of, of the downside of this, uh, uh, of this feature, the problem of low capacity. Uh, but, but again, we believe that uh, if we are able to demonstrate that this is in the interest of Europe, uh, 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 I think this is, uh, again, in our view, a no regret measure. Uh, I, I understand that there are concerns, there are discussions about uh, the indicator, whether this uh, economic surplus is the right definition and how we could define this better. But um, I, I'm not sure there is a, there is a, 
uh, another indicator to assess the, 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 the benefit of this uh, long-term flow-based. If you are able to propose one, uh, happy to discuss it. I will stop here. Um, uh, again, I would like to thank uh, all the participants to this uh, webinar and all those who, who helped to, to organize it. Uh, I would like to thank in particular those who uh, made this presentation and in particular you, Zoran, for the, the hard work. I will stop here. Thank you very much. Uh, have a good day and, and, uh, and we will continue the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye.